Hello, my friends. I'm Jared Halverson. This is Unshaken. And more importantly, this is happy birthday to us all. It has been four years since we started this grand adventure. And for those of you who have been with me the whole time, wow, you have endured it well. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of time together spent in Scripture, watching me go through the most brutal learning curve of anything I've ever done in my life. But we are now, for the first time, overlapping with what we did four years ago. I started in Jacob when COVID hit, and here we are back in Jacob to finish off the full cycle. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants, New Te Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon, start and, and now finishing. It's been an incredible experience. And I thank you for enduring it with me, for putting up with me, for growing with me. I hope, well, it's, it's interesting because here now, as I said before, we've, we've got a choice to make. Do we just end it and move on to other projects? Or do we start over, continue going through, but with a different, oh, a different approach? And that's the choice that we settled on. Uh, with the help of my friends at Faith Matters, we're going to make things closer to an hour. Uh, we're going to be filming at their facility, which is now done. And as of next week, we'll start with this new this new format. Uh, I'm sorry to those who have been uh, chomping at the bit and wondering what's taking me so long to shorten things. Part of it is my, I've got a bit of Jacob in me, some, some pastoral perfectionism, uh, and not wanting to leave any stone unturned or any scripture undiscussed. I've never met a verse I haven't liked, and so I want to introduce you to all of my friends. But now that that's done, I feel much more comfortable in reining myself in, uh, giving you all a break, and giving you about an hour's worth of what I consider the most important material. I'll have to pull a good Mormon and choose the 100th part. But then leaving the things unsaid at least are not unrecorded from four years before. So you've got a choice. You can either just stick with the new material and give us, give us an hour and then move on. There's so much other great material online as well. Or if that wets your whistle uh, and you want more of the same, well, not the same. Some of it will be overlapping, of course. It's the same scripture blocks. But to go deeper and to study more verses and to try to see that different approach, then all of the old videos will still be on YouTube. All of the old material will be available to you. And so you can double up or you can single out whatever you choose. Uh, just bear, bear with me on both ends. Because on the one hand, I've gone back and listened to some of my first stuff, and wow, did I have some growing up to do. You have someone who never intended to start this in the first place. And again, if it weren't for COVID, I never would have. But to have, oh, I've joked about it. When a camera and my brain are in the same room, only one works at a time. And constant mess-ups and redos and, and bad equipment and, and all of that. So if you go back to the old stuff, brace yourself. Uh, I have a lot less gray hair, which is nice. Uh, I was looking at the old stuff and realizing, wow, it's almost like a presidential uh, administration that they age a decade in the four years they're in the, uh, the Oval Office. And I've, de I've definitely aged a decade over the past four years of filming with you. Uh, but if you're interested in the content, I would just try to muscle through the bad sound. Uh, I would actually crank it up to about 1.5 on the speed. It, it sounds a little bit better that way, honestly, and, and sounds more urgent, like we've got important things to talk about, which we always do. Uh, and so, the, again, the old stuff will all be available. And especially when we get into the points where it's long and it's, and it's verse by verse, that could still be incredibly helpful for you. But starting next week, we'll be aiming for about an hour, give or take, and I'll be much, much more selective. That will be a new learning curve as I get used to new, new surroundings and different equipment and different setup and, and trying to be selective. So you may have to endure me well the next couple weeks or months as I get my feet underneath me uh, over with my friends at Faith Matters. But uh, cross your fingers and pray for me, and I'm praying for you every week, hoping that our time together in Scripture is the best time spent that we could have during the week. Now this, speaking of time spent, we'll have a lot of time spent at the end of today because we have the longest chapter in the Book of Mormon to cover, Jacob chapter 5. Four years ago, when I basically started there, I made like three or four different segments of trying to wrestle with faith crisis through the lens of Jacob 5. And is it a struggle with myself? Is it a struggle with the church? Is it a struggle with God? And looking at it from all these different angles, but jumping all over the text in order to do so. Today, we will be going verse by verse through the entire thing, 77 verses in this one chapter. If you remember last week in Jacob 4, Jacob himself complains, or at least laments, man, it's hard to engrave on plates. And then his pastoral perfectionism kicked in, and he thought, well, but I'm going to set out to, to inscribe the longest chapter in the entire record. And instead of summarizing the words of Zenos, 
Uh, Nephi does that at length in 1 Nephi 19, but his length is like eight verses. And he goes through all kinds of material that he learned from the prophet Zenos on the brass plates somewhere. That would have been in, in that was in his scriptures. It, it's not in our Bible. So I'm grateful that they're at least bringing in some lost books. But he was incredibly selective and summarizing material to say that Zenos was one who loved to talk about the house of Israel. He loved to talk about those on the isles of the sea. So an Israelite prophet with an eye to the, to the extensions, okay, to the, to the appendages, to scattered Israel. Now can you see why he'd spend so much time on his long allegory about the scattering and gathering of Israel? He also talked about the Messiah who would come, gave some incredible prophecies about his, his burial, his resurrection, this ongoing ministry. There's a lot of material there in 1 Nephi 19 to see Nephi summarizing the words and work of Zenos. But for Jacob, uh, it's not enough to summarize. I can't do it justice. I'm going to copy and, uh, copy and paste, or in his case, copy and, and engrave the entire thing. I, I don't care how long it is. There's so much important historical detail as he walks you through the entire panorama. So in some ways, if Nephi was willing to give us so much of his own visions that were historical or prophetic, I should say, history in reverse, 1 Nephi 11, 12, 13, 14, with uh, New, New Testament history and Book of Mormon history and apostasy restoration history and last days history, Zenos did essentially the same thing, but zeroing in on a few central themes. But he walks you through all that historical time period as well. And so no wonder Jacob didn't want to miss a thing, didn't want to, to lose anything by way of, of summarizing. So he didn't abridge, he just copied and boom, here it is. So chapter five is going to be where we spend the first half of our lesson this week. Uh, it's going to be a while. Uh, and then chapter six and seven, we'll save for our second half. Chapter six is where Jacob is summarizing kind of his take. Now that I've given it to you, let me make sure you understand what I'm doing. Uh, and then actually, in some ways, it reminds me of what we've seen so many times with Isaiah. Here's a few verses of motivation. Then here's the long quotation. And then here's an extended explanation. And we see the same thing with this, the allegory of the olive tree. The end of Jacob four was Jacob's motivation. Yeah, it's to let us know why he's so intent on giving us the entire thing. You remember what he wrestled with at the end of Jacob 4 last week. Go back and reread this because that's the lead-in to this allegory. And it's this idea of the, the Jewish tendency from Old Testament time period to look beyond the mark, as Jacob says it, is going to lead them to look beyond the Messiah's mark and miss Jesus when he comes. But the scriptures say that's their one, their one hope is their Messiah, is Jesus. And if you reject the, the stone that is meant to be your cornerstone, how on earth are you going to build, on, build a building on top of, of nothing? Well, that's the question he's trying to answer with the allegory of the olive tree. How will people get, how will the house of Israel ever get a second chance? And what an answer Zenos gives us. Remember what Jacob says at the end of chapter 4. I, I really hope I can answer this if I don't get tripped up and stumble over my over-anxiety for you. I am so concerned that you're going to miss the point. I'm, I'm seeing your tendency to look beyond the mark. I'm seeing your tendency to justify sin and all those things we studied last week. And if that continues, you're going to miss the point of it all too. So I am, I am over, I'm pushing through my anxiety and my anxiety over my anxiety in hopes of giving you the best history slash prophecy lesson I can think of with the help of a mighty prophet who had his eye fixed on the gathering of scattered Israel. Let's talk about that. And so that's chapter five. Chapter six then is his explanation, brief, of all, everything that went before. And then we'll finish this week with chapter seven, which is one of my favorites because we get to meet our first antichrist. Uh, and so for one who studies anti-religious rhetoric, it's tough to beat Sherem because he was a master at the craft. Okay, so that's this week for us in a nutshell. And I'm really excited to dive in. Now, to do this, I want to introduce a concept, though, that will hopefully help us in our scripture study, not just this week, but every week. The Bible is the, is the book that has been looked at, studied, poured over more than any other book in human history. And what's interesting about this text is, especially throughout the Middle Ages, they had all kinds of different approaches 
to, ta to tackle the same text. I'm going to put out a chart here so uh, you, you on YouTube will be able to see it. But there, they call them the senses of Scripture. And there's different numberings of these, but most come down to four. Four different senses of Scripture. And which sense are you taking on as you study this particular text? Most medieval uh, commentators and readers would try to tackle all four. And it's almost like that parable of the elephant on the blind men. And they're looking at it from different angles or feeling different parts and trying to make sense of what this thing is. And the four different angles that they were looking at Scripture from, first is the literal slash historical. And that one's pretty straightforward. In fact, it was meant to be straightforward because you're looking for the straightforward meaning of the text. Uh, as if there's nothing to read into it, there's no symbolism, there's nothing figurative. Let's just look at it at, at face value and try to make sense of what was happening. The focus there is on the past. This is stuff has already been written. What did it mean in its original context? Okay. The second sense of scripture is called the typological or a word that we might know better, the allegorical. So typological as in types and shadows, allegorical as in an allegory. And oh, well, we get, we get the allegory of the olive tree today. It's made for it. Well, what typology is about and what allegory is, it's this focus on what well, we're studying in scripture, not to see just what's face value in the text, but rather what parallels are in it that tie it to the life of Christ, especially. Is there something here that is a foreshadowing of more important things to come? Okay, And so when we put on our, symbolic gla our symbolism glasses, for example, and start looking at things, parables are this way to, to, to perfection, right? And allegories uh, even more intensely. Uh, and so it's, it goes beyond what meets the eye. And maybe that's somewhere where, or something where Jacob's anxiety kicked in because it's like, oh no. I'm trying to overcome the tendency to look beyond the mark, and yet I'm going to quote an, an allegory which asks us to look beyond the surface. We're going to have to find the right depth perception here. So we look past surface, but not beyond mark. And so what could this allegory be pointing to? But if literal or historical confines itself to the past, typological, allegorical connects the past with the present. Like we're going through these things and, oh, they talked about this. I, I know what scripture story I'm living right now. Okay, Matthew did that all the time throughout his book when he was watching the ministry of Jesus. And then an Old Testament scripture would pop into his head. And he'd be like, oh, it's just like that one. And he'd quote it. The kind of an allegorical reading of the Old Testament. Now, the third sense of scripture is called the moral, or if you want a fancy word to add to your vocabulary, the tropological and what, I mean, what we mean by that is we're looking for ethical principles in the text that we can follow in life. And not just an ethical principle where God says, go love thine enemy, but rather, oh, you're reading the parable of the Good Samaritan, for example. And you're seeing, oh, what he's doing is how I'm supposed to treat my neighbor. Got it. So it's not just I'm reading an old story, the literal historical. It's not just I'm reading a preview of coming events, the uh, allegorical slash uh, typological, but I am reading something that is, it's like Aesop's fables almost. I'm reading something that is teaching me an ethical principle. The rubber's got to hit the roads at some point, and I need to live a better life, a more moral life as a result of what I'm seeing here. So we've seen the past in the literal, connecting past and present in the allegorical. We're now seeing strictly present in the moral, because morally, how, I'm, how, I'm, how am I supposed to live right now? And then the fourth sense of scripture is what's known as the anagogical or the eschatological. I told you we'd be expanding our vocabulary today. Well, these are hints of future things. I'm reading scripture not to just see what was taking place in the past or how I'm supposed to live in the present, but some kind of subtle hints, some kind of foreshadowing parallels of the last days. In fact, that's what eschatology means. The end of the world is eschatology. And so the eschatological sense of scripture, also known as the anagogical sense of scripture, this is prophecy. This is the end times. This is final judgment. This is millennial reign. This is the, the celestial glory. And am I finding something in scripture that tends to relate to that? That again, is beyond surface level. Now, I'll give you an example really quick of each one. Because we're going to be seeing, 
Well, to me, Jacob 5 is an amazing place to practice all these senses of Scripture. So let me, let me lay it out quickly to, to start. Remember from Jacob 4, verse 17, here is Jacob's question in a nutshell. How is it possible that these, the house of Israel, that these, after having rejected the sure foundation, can ever build upon it, that it may become the head of their corner? Now from there, Jacob turns to Zenos and begins quoting this, this long text. If we were to read Jacob 5 only from the literal sense, we'd wonder, what on earth does an olive vineyard have to do with anything? We'd start wondering if Zenos was less of a prophet and more of a, an agricultural worker. Because man, this guy knows all about his digging and dunging and his weeding and watering. Is that all it is, though? Is this is purely historical? It's literal? That's all I'm taking. The second level, second sense, is the allegorical. And again, this is the allegory of the olive tree, so it's a perfect fit. For this one, it's more a matter of, hmm, how will scattered Israel ever be gathered? How will the house of Israel ever get a chance to rebuild upon Jesus Christ when they rejected him the first time he came? That's really the sense that, that, that Zenos is writing in and the sense that Jacob is reading in. Again, he, he calls it out. This is an allegory. Let's use the allegorical sense of Scripture as we study it. The third sense is then moral. And this is one where we can really come in and see, based on this allegory, how should I live? Maybe for this sense of Scripture, we're asking the question, how can sinners repent and come unto Christ? Not just how can the house of Israel rebuild upon him, but me, my own life, my own moral or sadly occasionally immoral life. Is it over for me? Do I have hope that I can rebuild? Well, watch, read the allegory in those through that lens. You'll see incredible lessons. And then the fourth, the anagogical or the eschatological. Think about it in these terms for last days kinds of setting. How can apostasy be overcome by restoration? What will the millennial reign be like? And how does the Lord get us through the last days until his glorious second coming? There's a lot of judgment being passed in this allegory. And at what point does it become final judgment and the burning of the vineyard? We'll end with that eschatological sense because it is last days where the, parable or where the allegory finally comes to its close. You with me? I will do occasionally, not very often, but every once in a while, I'll pause. We'll kind of get a sense of where we are in the parable or in the allegory. And then we'll do a quick review of these four senses of Scripture so you can get a, can you, so you can get a sense of the different lenses through which you can read what we're studying. You with me on this? Okay, it's a fascinating, again, throughout the Middle Ages particularly, they were masters at all of these senses of Scripture. And if you feel like you've maxed out on your Scripture study, Maybe you've only been reading it literally historically. And it's time to start looking for moral lessons or parallels to the life of Christ or foreshadowings of the last days. I think as Latter-day Saints, living in the last days, we're pretty good at that last one. Okay? We see these parallels. We draw them out. But there's always room for improvement. Okay? Keep on practicing. But with that, let's dive in. Jacob chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Behold, my brethren... Do ye not remember to have read the words of the prophet Zenos, which he spake unto the house of Israel? And then he starts to quote, and he'll keep quoting for the next 76 verses. Hearken, O ye house of Israel, and hear the words of me, a prophet of the Lord. And as I said, based on Nephi's take with Zenos, this is a prophet who focuses on the house of Israel, those on the isles of the sea, how will the scattered be gathered what will the ministry of Jesus Christ or, or the, the Messiah be like? He talks about the covenants of the Lord, and that's what's keeping the Lord of the vineyard engaged with these olive trees that are struggling. Amazing things. In fact, the, the way that Nephi finalizes his summary of Zenos' words, he says this in 1 Nephi 19, 18. I, Nephi, have written these things unto my people, these words of Zenos, that perhaps I might persuade them that they would remember the Lord, their Redeemer. Remember, Nephi quotes Isaiah for his persuasive power. He's now quoting Zenos for his persuasive power. And Jacob's going to do the same thing. I hope that you have hope because of these prophecies. I hope that you can see the Lord, your Redeemer, and remember him remembering you. 
Okay, covenant connection. He's all in. That's Nephi's focus in 1 Nephi 19, drawing on Zenos. That's going to be Jacob's focus, drawing on Zenos for the rest of this long chapter. Then verse 3, Jacob says, or I should say, Zenos says, Behold, thus saith the Lord, I will liken thee, O house of Israel, like unto a tame olive tree, which a man took and nourished in his vineyard, and it grew. That's the good news. But it doesn't take long for the bad news to start. It waxed old and began to decay. And that's going to be a problem, especially for an ancient Israelite, since they rely so heavily on olives. In our day, some people pick olives out of their salad, especially the green ones. I I do that, I'll admit. Uh, Others, for the black ones, my favorite thing as a kid was to put them on my fingers at at Thanksgiving. So I had olive tips uh, on all of my fingers, and and then you just eat them off of the fingers. Now, uh, for others, olive oil, yeah, that makes sense. And yet, we in our day have no idea, really, just how essential this crop was for the ancients. It was a source of food for them. It was a source, uh, because in its oil form, it's a source of light and therefore heat. It was what was used in the... In the temple of Solomon, the tabernacle of Moses, I mean, the, the, the candle stand, the candelabra, right, the menorah, it's absolutely essential. When the parable of the Good Samaritan takes place, what does he pour into the wounds of this, of this poor man? Oil and wine. And it's olive oil that he's using. To think about the, all of the, the things that, all of the uses to which olive oil can be put, this is an absolutely essential, essential thing. When you think about, oh, the salt losing its savor, like Jesus says, the, the olive oil, Israel cannot lose its olive trees. It cannot lose its olive oil. It, when, you, when you think of Jesus saying, ye are the light of the world. Well, we can't dim ourselves if we don't have enough oil in our vessels. Okay, what, was, what were the ten virgins banking on? How can I get more olive oil? There are so many things here going on. When Jesus says uh, on the way to Gethsemane that I am the true vine, and you've, and it, you've got to be tapped into that true vine or you will wither and die spiritually. Well, we're seeing all kinds of these elements and parallels just based on oh, the topic that Zenos chooses to teach his fellow Israelites. They would be with him every step of the way. On the literal historical sense of Scripture, They'd think, oh yeah, this Zenos guy knows exactly what I should be doing back home in my vineyard. But then again, taking it to the allegorical level, taking it to the moral level, the eschatological level, oh, there's so many more layers of meaning here. What do we mean by the fact that it began to decay? If you actually remember in our Isaiah chapters, Nephi's already dropped a hint here. And again, maybe since Nephi's okay with summarizing things, Well, actually, he didn't. He quoted Isaiah at length. But this was a quick version of the same kind of thing, and it comes from Isaiah chapter 5. So Isaiah 5, also known as 2 Nephi 15. Listen to this. This is the first four verses. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. So here we're getting the vineyard version instead of the olive yard. And yet wine, grapes, were almost as essential to Israelite life and economy as olives were. So pick your crop, it's fine, but the same idea here. Here's a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Great potential. He fenced it, he gathered out the stones thereof, he planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it did. Unfortunately, it brought forth wild grapes. Those of you who already know the, par- the allegory of the olive tree, you've seen the parallels. But with that brief description, Isaiah cuts to the chase. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? That is a, a preview of coming lamentations in Jacob 5 as well. What could I have done more? You judge. The problems here, the decay, the withering, the wildness, is that my fault or theirs? I'll let you decide. He then says, wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. In other words, why did it turn out this way? 
I gave it all I've got. Why didn't things turn out better? Isaiah is asking that question very briefly in his fifth chapter. Nephi brings it up in his 15th in 2 Nephi. Zenos extends the metaphor as long as anyone ever has. And Jacob's going to take the full version. Go all in, all out. Make sure we understand this. And then one last hint from the Isaiah passage. This is Isaiah 5 verse 7. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. With that in mind, go back and start making the parallels. In Zenos' allegory, we will meet a Lord of the vineyard. Well, who do you think that is? And here we have the Lord of life, the King of kings, the God of Israel. And what's he doing to work with his olive trees? Those, that is the house of Israel. Those are the various tribes. Uh, he has servants that he calls to come and labor in the vineyard with him. Who might that be? Ah, those are the, his servants, the prophets. And whether by my own voice or theirs, it's all the same to him. Okay? How do the olive trees uh, re react to or respond to the work of those servants, though? Mm, that's one thing we'll have to wrestle with. And then all of the various things that the Lord of the vineyard and his servants do to the trees, that's the, uh, this idea of crying repentance and, and scattering Israel and then gathering Israel and, and doing everything within God's power in hopes of changing what is wild into something tame, into something productive. What fruit will I harvest when all is said and done? What kind of people will there be when judgment is passed? Okay, you getting the big picture? Now, in Isaiah's version, it's kind of a one-size-fits-all, or a one-scene-fits-all time periods. But in the allegory of the olive tree from, Z from Zenos, it is a master class in history of prophecy, prophecy rolling out before us to see what the, process, what the process will look like going forward. And for this, let me just give you a quick summary. It'll chart here again. And I'll remind you as we go through what scene we're in. If this is an allegory, this is a, this is a, a play, and there's going to be basically four main acts. I've seen other scholars uh, bring up five, maybe six. I think some of the end ones can be, can be reduced and, and combined. But the time periods, let's look at it this way. Verse 4 through 14, roughly, will be Old Testament time period. And by the way, you can usually see when one scene ends and the next scene begins by looking for phrases like, a long time passed away. It's like, mm, okay. Close the curtain, open it again, and we have a little bit different backdrop, okay? Another phrase that's a useful trans marker of a transition is, let us go down. Okay, some time has passed, and the Lord of the vineyard says to his servant, ah, let's start the next scene. Let's go down and start working again in the vineyard. You with me? Keep an eye out for those, and you'll start to see, oh, end of scene one, start of scene two. If the first scene was Old Testament time period, second scene is going to be roughly New Testament time period, and we can include the Book of Mormon in that as well, even though Book of Mormon overlaps old and new. But that's going to last from about verse 15 till about verse 28 which then gives way to the third scene, the third act, if we want to call it that, which is verse 29 through about 51. This one is harder to, to label its end point. But this is the period of the great apostasy. Things really start going wrong in the vineyard here. But then it starts to transition about verse 52 into the restoration. And again, that's where it's tricky. It's not a set time and, oh, and a long time passed and the Lord came down again. It's trickier to, to distinguish because apostasy kind of naturally flows into restoration. And it's kind of a tug of war for a while there of what's, what's going to happen with these trees. Now, if you wanted to further subdivide the restoration time period, yeah, you, could all, you could cut off the last few verses and create a final fifth scene that has more to do with the millennial reign and the judgment day. Uh, you can do that. I'm going to kind of lump it all together and keep that end from 52 to 77 as our fourth and final scene. But keep an eye on the big picture, kind of see what scene we're in, and it'll make more sense as far as what scripture we're, we're likening and what time period we're, we're watching. Okay?
So let's begin the actual story. Here's where the drama begins. So far, it's just kind of been narrator uh, standing out in front of the curtain on the stage. But now he walks away, the, sta- the, the curtain parts, and we see the first scene unfold. Verse 4. It came to pass that the master of the vineyard, there's the God of Israel, went forth, and he saw that his olive tree, there's the house of Israel, began to decay. Here we see apostasy in ancient Israel, spiritual decline that gets repeated so often in the pages of the Old Testament. Well, in response to what he sees, the master of the vineyard said, I will prune it. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to just cut everything down. There's got to be something I can do here. Well, first thought, let's prune it. And I love the thought of this. All the, all the actions of the Lord of the vineyard and his servant are so applicable. Once you see past the literal into the allegorical or even the moral. To prune something back, it's like, remember that great uh, parable of the currant bush that Hubie Brown talked about? I'm the gardener here. And everything had grown up and nothing really had grown out as far as as fruit was concerned. So he chopped it all back. He pruned it. And when we prune something, we're getting rid of the extraneous, the things that don't really matter. I'm focusing on what matters most. If you think about the thorny ground in the parable of the sower, I'm weeding here, okay? Or in this case, I'm pruning back and thinking, you know what, this branch isn't doing much. Let's cut it off and focus. Let's channel the energies and strength of the soil, the soil and the sun and the water into something that's actually going to produce. Okay? It's, not the qual- it's not the quantity of our fruit that matters. It's its quality. So let's do some pruning. Second verb, and dig about it. That's an interesting one because we're going to loosen the soil by digging about it. We might have to rough up some of the surface level roots that are just beneath the topsoil as we dig about, but that's going to force it to sink roots even deeper. It's going to give it better access to the water table that might be further down beneath the surface. In some ways, again, if we're paralleling this to the parable of the sower, this sounds more like stony ground. I'm digging about it to get rid of those stones. I'm digging about it to loosen the soil and get get the roots to go deeper. And then the third verb, we've seen prune, we've seen dig, now let's nourish. It seems to be more open to it than before. And it's actually going to do something with the nourishment that's more focused than previously. So let's nourish this tree. Give it all it needs to grow and flourish. In the parable of the the sower, this would be the good soil, where I'm just trying to increase the plant's fruitfulness. First 30-fold, then 60-fold, then 100-fold, and so forth. And why is the Lord of the vineyard going to do all this work? I love what he says next. That perhaps it may shoot forth young and tender branches. Now the perhaps there lets you know there's no guarantees. God really does honor agency. And yet he'll do all within his power to work within it in hopes that we'll use our agency for, to, to move towards spiritual growth. Perhaps young and tender branches will grow. And to think about this decaying old Israelite tree and all that God, the God of Israel is doing to, to shake them, to shape them, to, to help them, to nourish them, even redemptive turbulence. If you think about the, the saw and the axe that were used in terms of the Assyrians and Babylonians, it's all meant to be helpful. Even when God comes out with his pruning shears. Okay, with his, his hoe and his pickaxe or his shovel, all of those things. It's like you can picture the tree like bracing itself, like, oh, oh, here it comes. What have I done? Well, I'm, I'm here to help. Perhaps new growth will come. People actually willing to keep commandments. People bringing forth the fruits of repentance. And what's the result of all that work? Read the next verse. It came to pass that he pruned it and digged about it and nourished it according to his word. So God does everything he says he will. He did it according to his word. And it came to pass that after many days, so be patient here. God is patient. He's eternal. He can afford to be, right? Change takes time. Growth isn't instantaneous. That's why I love the plant metaphors, okay? So after many days, it began to put forth somewhat, a little, young and tender branches. I love how... 
slow, how gradual this all seems to be. These are baby steps. This is, these are small beginnings, but there's hope here. Oh, look at that little sprout. Look at this tender branch beginning to grow. I see a bud where I didn't see anything before. But here's the problem. But behold, the main top thereof began to perish. If you think back to all we studied in the Isaiah chapters, which would be the kind of key time period in this first act, this first scene, what was happening with Israel? It was decaying. The main top thereof was beginning to perish. There were bits of righteousness here and there. Remember Isaiah's son, a remnant shall return. There's Sheher Yashub. And in some ways, what we, we, we talked about this with the Assyrians coming, and then later the Babylonians coming. God is whittling away the wicked to the point that he's pruning branches. This is, these are not bringing forth good fruit. But if I can get it down to the bare essential, if I can bring us to a righteous remnant that will remain, or with the scattering, a righteous remnant that will eventually return, then there's hope here. The main is decaying, but these younger tender branches, ooh, there seems to be something going on. So think about what Daniel becomes off in Babylon, what Ezekiel is trying to maintain in Babylonian captivity as well. What Jeremiah is doing, holding on to as many faithful as he can find there in Jerusalem. Again, Isaiah's incredible work with people like Hezekiah. There, is, there are good things, but they are young and tender branches. It's not, the tree itself really still seems to be struggling. With that, go forward to verse 7 and 8. It came to pass that the master of the vineyard saw it. And he said unto his servant, here's where the prophets come in, It grieveth me that I should lose this tree. I think it was the Westminster Confession that said God is a God without body, parts, or passions. But we don't believe that. The book of Moses lets us know that we believe in a God who weeps, one who is grieved, one that can be moved with the feelings of our infirmities. We don't have a high priest who can't be touched, the book of Hebrews says. So here we see a Lord of the vineyard who grieves, a God of deep feeling and emotion. Can you sense why Jacob himself would be drawn to this, drawn to this depiction of God? Because Jacob himself is that emotional, is that deep in his feelings of things. His heart, he wears his heart on his sleeve, and so does this Lord of the vineyard. He's grieved by this. And so what is his plan? He says to his servant, Wherefore, go and pluck the branches from a wild olive tree. Bring them hither unto me, and we will pluck off those main branches which are beginning to wither away, and we will cast them into the fire that they may be burned. There's the destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians. There's the destruction of the southern kingdom by the Babylonians. Burned by fire. But it's meant to eliminate the branches that are dying anyway in, in hopes of making room for something wild to be grafted in. The way he puts it here, Behold, saith the Lord of the vineyard, I take away many of these young and tender branches, and I will graft them whithersoever I will. And it mattereth not, that if it so be that the root of this tree will perish, it's like, that's okay. I may preserve the fruit thereof unto myself. Wherefore, I will take these young and tender branches, and I will graft them whithersoever I will. Now, in those two verses, you start seeing the Lord of the Vineyard bring outsiders in and spread insiders out. We are shuffling the deck. We are moving things around here. Uh, essentially, that was the Assyrian game plan. Remember, how do I conquer the world and then keep my, subje my subjects in subjection? Well, if I shuffle the deck and start moving around all these conquered peoples, then they're less likely to fight for a land that wasn't theirs to begin with. They're strangers and foreigners somewhere else. And they've mixed and married with other populations. Okay? It's a loss of sense of identity. It's a loss of connection to, to land. I'm, I'm uprooted, literally, okay? Or in this case, I'm being cut and scattered, or outside, those are cut and brought in. You with me? What's happening here, the Lord is really starting to work. This is desperate times calling for desperate measures. I'm going to scatter Israel with the help of the Assyrians. 
And maybe, just maybe, these young and tender branches, if I move them somewhere else, again, are you thinking Lehi? We'll see that more clearly in just a moment. Uh, but to see these groups, if I can just get them away, some of you have moved for that exact reason that I don't like the influences that my children are growing up around. And if we just pick up and move somewhere else, or you're hoping for a different friend to come in and change the, the friend group that your child is a part of, you're hoping for some pruning. And if they would stop getting so distracted by these lesser diversions, they could actually have some strength to move forward and prepare for their missions or their marriage or life in general. The, we... <laughs> Parents particularly, we feel the pain of the Lord of the Vineyard. And again, as we're looking for allegory that's not just big picture, but the moral that's more individualized, again, I hope we're seeing ourselves here. Okay. I also want to point out one thing here because it very quickly changes. And I just want to point it out. He said, okay, fine, maybe the root will end up dying. But the, the root doesn't matter as much as the fruit. That's the way he puts it here. It mattereth not if it so be the root of the tree will perish. As long as I preserve the, the fruit, good to go. But that is only good in the short term. Because if you want more than just this year's harvest, oh, then the root has to outlive the fruit. You can harvest that fruit and lay it up in store, but the root has to remain and stay strong if you're ever going to have another harvest the next year as it comes around. Now, you understand that? So here it seems to be a little bit more short-term goal. It's all about fruit. That's what I'm focused on. Uh, root, take it or leave it. Okay? It, it, I'm not here to just create a shade garden. This is not just look at all these amazing trees. I'm in it for productivity. Remember in Isaiah's message, there's a vineyard there, which means I'm going to harvest the grapes. Not vineyard, excuse me. There's a wine press there. That's what I meant. There's a wine press, which means I'm going to harvest the grapes and, and crush them because I want juice from this. I want wine from this. This is a working garden. And so it's all about fruit. What's interesting here, though, is, it, like I said, this will quickly change to the point where the Lord starts saying, actually, I know fruit's the, ma the, the main object of our efforts. But I do love these roots, and I do love these trees. And if there's a way to preserve both roots and produce fruits, can we do that? I want us to wrestle with this in terms of the Jewish roots of Christianity, the Catholic and Protestant roots of the Restoration, to, to see where we've come from, not just where we're going, and God isn't just going to pour everything into the young, tender branches. He's always keeping an eye on roots and trunk as well because he wants to preserve the whole thing. He's no respecter of persons. So whether it's old growth or new growth, he wants everything to survive. You understand? Keep that in mind. It will become more and more clear as we move forward. But let's move forward. Verse 9 through 11 Take thou the branches of the wild olive tree, and graft them in, in the stead thereof. So we are bringing some outsiders into Israel. Thank you, Assyria, for bringing some of those in. What's interesting, that's where the Samaritans come from, for example. And yet the Jews couldn't stand the Samaritans. And yet, when Jesus went forth to minister, remember the woman at the well? Samaritan. Her whole village started showing interest in the gospel as she taught them and then Jesus taught them, right? There's something that happens when you bring an outsider in. There's something good that comes when a new convert comes into an old ward and shakes things up and helps people see things from a different perspective. It's beautiful. So thank you, wild olive trees, for what you're going to bring in, some new life. You might shock us into better productivity ourselves. He then says, These which I have plucked off, I will cast into the fire and burn them, that they may not cumber the ground of my vineyard. And those are just the very worst branches that seem to be beyond redemption. Okay, this is part of the pruning process. It came to pass that the servant of the Lord of the vineyard did, according to the word of the Lord of the vineyard, that go figure, <laughs> prophets actually keeping commandments and doing the Lord's will. That's what they're trained for. That's what they live for. But they grafted in the branches of the wild olive tree. 
and the Lord of the vineyard caused that it should be digged about and pruned and nourished, just like he said he would, saying unto his servant, it grieveth me that I should lose this tree. So it, it only lasted like one or two verses of just like, ah, tree, take it or leave it. It's all about the fruit. It's like, nah, more, the more I think about it, I love this tree. It hurts my heart. It grieves me to lose it. Wherefore, that perhaps, again, it's, I, I'm amazed at how frequently he mentions the, the, the gamble here. I'm not guaranteeing a thing. I'm honoring agency. But perhaps if we do all of this work, I might preserve the roots thereof, that they perish not, that I might preserve them unto myself. I have done this thing. So there you have it. The roots are important after all. You picture these servants like, oh, Lord of the vineyard, you old softy. I knew you weren't just about the ends uh, and didn't care about how we got there. I, know, I, I watched you plant these trees. You have been with them from the very beginning. And you can't, you can't handle the thought of any of them dying for good. I'm grateful for that. I'm here to help. With that, verse 12. Wherefore the Lord says to his servants, Go thy way, watch the tree, nourish it according to my words. So the prophets following God's command, striving to strengthen the people, doing it the Lord's way, but watching. It's a long process. Okay, Be patient here, prophets. These will I place in the nethermost part of my vineyard. Whithersoever I will, it mattereth not unto thee. Here's the scattering of Israel. You don't have to worry geographically where they all happen to be. I know where I have led them. I've marked on the map everywhere I've planted trees, everywhere I have, have scattered branches, even to the nethermost part, places you've never heard of. And why am I doing it? I do it that I may preserve unto myself the natural branches of the tree. And also, that I may lay up fruit thereof against the season unto myself. I mean, in most agricultural areas, there's a growing season and then a harvest and then time where you're not growing a thing. And how are you going to eat through the long winter? Well, I have to be able to lay up fruit against that season. Now, I remember as a kid watching my mom or my grandma can fruit. And it's a lost art, but to see the can and then to, to put the fruit in there and then to seal the lid so nothing outside can come in to cause decay. I love that word, to seal it. And to think about what God is trying to do to bring forth the fruits of righteousness and to seal us His so that there is no outside decay that will keep us from continual growth. He wants to preserve us in his kingdom. This is the Lord of the harvest putting the, 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 the grain in the granary. Okay, It's to put it into the storehouse, or as Ammon called it, the garner. What is the garner of God? In our day, we would consider it the temple more, more than anything. Uh, where we are sealed to each other, but also sealed to God in a way that is meant to preserve us against this season of death and decay known as the last days. That's, the, 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 that, that's God's goal. That's the, the hope of the Lord of the harvest. And again, what emotion motivates him? It grieveth me that I should lose this tree and the fruit thereof. Well, with that grief... And yet that hope, sounds like the Lord of the vineyard himself has faith and great anxiety, right? It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard went his way and hid the natural branches of the tame olive tree in the nethermost parts of the vineyard, some in one, some in another, according to his will and pleasure. Now, if that's not the scattering of Israel, I don't know what it is. But again, it's God who knows where he has led them. Think about this verse from 3 Nephi 17, verse 4. When the risen Lord is there among the Nephites and telling them, I've had a great day with you and I'll come back for day two, but I do have to go gather the lost tribes of the house of Israel. Okay, You are the other sheep from the Jews, but there are yet other, other lost sheep from you. And they need to hear my voice too. But the way he says it in 3 Nephi 17, 4, 
Now I go unto the Father, and also to show myself unto the lost tribes of Israel, for they are not lost unto the Father. He knoweth whither he hath taken them. I get that same sense from what Zenos is saying here. Well, that is the first scene, the first act of this play. And the curtain closes, and the narrator comes out and just lets us wait for a moment. Kind of a brief intermission. If you need to go up and get some more popcorn, whatever you need. Uh, but here, verse 15, the second scene quickly follows. And you see the transition with words like this. It came to pass that a long time passed away. Second scene begins. We're now in New Testament time period, Book of Mormon time period. I mean, Israel's been scattered. That's what we saw at the end of scene one. And this scene two will last basically from verse 15 here until we get to verse 28. And I'll mark the transition there as well. But here, this long time has passed away. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Come, let us go down into the vineyard that we may labor in the vineyard. Again, another transition statement. Time has passed. We're going to go down and resume our labors. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard and also the servant went down into the vineyard to labor. And it came to pass that the servant said unto his master, Behold, look here. Behold the tree. Remember, the servant was told to watch. Well, he's been watching. And notice what he noticed. Okay, look at this one. Behold the tree. It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard looked and beheld the tree in the which the wild olive branches had been gathered in. What's going to happen with this bit of horticultural experimentation? Well, good news. It had sprung up and begun to bear fruit. Now, that's good news, but that's just what's visible. How does the fruit taste? Let's take one and see what we think of it. He beheld that it was good. Oh, it's working. The fruit thereof was like unto the natural fruit. Oh, can you imagine the, if we saw the grief on the face of the Lord of the, of the vineyard before, can you imagine the euphoria he's feeling now? It's working. All of these efforts are not in vain. Cutting off the dead branches halted the decay so that it wasn't spreading to the rest of it, okay? Kind of this, this blight that's going to cause problems throughout every branch. It's now gone. And then bringing in this outside influence actually brought new life kind of kick-started some good growth. And so, okay, it's working. What do we do now? Verse 18, He said unto the servant, Behold, the branches of the wild tree have taken hold of the moisture of the root thereof, that the root thereof hath brought forth much strength. So the root is what we owe the credit to. I knew the roots were good. I knew I was, I was wise to get past my, my utilitarianism for that, that lasted about one verse. And realize it, if there's ever going to be fruit that really, that really matters, it's going to be because of the strength of the roots down below. So their strength, their moisture, they're doing what they were designed to accomplish. And because of the much strength of the root thereof, the wild branches have brought forth tame fruit. In some ways, the, the nature of these branches have changed. They've gone from wild to tame. They've improved. They've progressed. They've been domesticated into a form of discipleship that will make all the difference in the world to them and to others. Tame fruit. What I've been hoping for from the start. Now, if we had not grafted in these branches, the tree thereof would have perished. And now behold, I shall lay up much fruit, which the tree thereof hath brought forth, and the fruit thereof I shall lay up against the season unto mine own self. If we stopped there, this in some ways would just be the conclusion of scene one. And this would just be return and report. See how things went? And wow, the scattering of Israel accomplished all that it was, all that it was meant to do. In that Old Testament time period, the Assyrians came, the Babylonians came, and boom, once, that, once the dust settled, all was well. We're ready for the Messianic age. Well, if we know our Old Testament history, and especially on, on to the New Testament, that wasn't the case. So brace yourself for a longer second scene. But pause here and realize what good news this is at this moment. 
In fact, pause here and let's go through our senses of Scripture once again. If we stick with the literal, well, what do we know? Huh. Good roots can lead to good fruits. I need to remember that the next time I'm working out in the field and have a little more hope that my trees might actually turn things. Now, if that's the literal, though, what about the allegorical, since this is the allegory of the olive tree? What Jacob really wants us to see, what Zenos intended, is to understand that the house of Israel's strength depends on tapping back into its origin in the Abrahamic covenant. Those are the roots. And yes, those roots are good. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, the patriarchs, the matriarchs, the covenant whereby Israel became God's chosen people. Oh, those roots will remain. And if you could somehow tap into the moisture that they are gathering from the soil, then yes, even wild branches can be tamed and bring forth good fruit. To think about those being adopted into the house of Israel and things changing as a result, them becoming good, outsiders coming in. It's beautiful what's happening historically or allegorically. Well, what about morally? If we read this same first scene with the moral sense, then hopefully we're recognizing that if I'm spiritually struggling, and need to gain more spiritual strength, what are some options? What, how do I prune and dig and nourish? Are there things in my life that are distracting me from what really matters? Elder Maxwell used to say, often our biggest struggles are not with temptation, but with diversion. And again, we're diverting what could have gone to spiritual strength into economic strength or political power or social influence or whatever else it might be. We have limited resources. There's only so much moisture that is coming in, so much sunlight that's shining. Where will you place the emphasis in your photosynthesis? Right? Well, if that's what we can do, if we can clear away distractions, if we can cut off our worst sins... And then, if we can get back to the roots of our faith and testimony, if I can dust off shelf number one, right, and look back and see all the things God has done to bless me and teach me and lift me and lead me, it's amazing what it does to bring incipient wildness back into gospel subjection, gospel goodness, real fruitfulness. Okay, recenter my faith in the roots of Jesus Christ, and all will be well. And then one last sense of Scripture, the anagogical or the eschatological last days. How's the restoration going to proceed? Well, by restoring the old roots. Oh, there's moisture there. There's strength there. That's why we talk about the gospel as the new and everlasting covenant. Everlasting, because those roots are solid, but new because new growth was required, new restoration. We are, what's interesting, there, there was a Methodist scholar of Mormonism. Okay, she was raised Methodist and believed in Methodism, but academically, her favorite subject was, was Mormonism in all of its historical varieties. And as she studied the restoration through Joseph Smith, she pointed out something I don't even think we Latter-day Saints had noticed. She said, you know what? When Joseph Smith set out to restore the gospel and the church, other groups were doing similar things. There were restorationists in various pockets of American religion. And yet what Joseph Smith did was truly unique because not only was he restoring New Testament Christianity, he was restoring Old Testament Judaism as well. I, when he went back, he went all the way back. It wasn't just how do we reform a New Testament church. It was how do we gather an Old Testament Israel? How do we tap back in to the original roots of the Abrahamic covenant? And all that we're hearing recently from President Nelson about letting Israel prevail and, and gathering Israel on both sides of the veil and the Abrahamic covenant and what it means to us I don't think any Latter-day prophet has emphasized that more than he, except for Joseph Smith. Joseph knew what was happening. Talk about a servant in the vineyard that's helping all of this happen. Okay? Now again, 
historically, so we're still seeing one, now transitioning to scene two. This is still Old Testament, now starting to transition into new. But if we're looking at it from the anagogical sense, uh, it's, it's those things that are going to happen in the last days to prepare the earth for the second coming and the millennial reign. You with me? Okay, preview of coming attractions. Well, let's go back, deep, dig deep then into second scene, second act, and look at verse 19. It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto the servant, Come, let us go to the nethermost part of the vineyard. Because so far they've been looking at the trees right, right here at the center. We've been looking at Israel itself. And things are going much better here. But let's go check the nethermost. Where did we scatter things? Let's go check it out and behold if the natural branches of the tree have not brought forth much fruit also. We've got good news here. I'm hoping there's good news everywhere that I may lay up of the fruit thereof against the season unto mine own self. And it came to pass that they went forth, whither the master had hid the natural branches of the tree. I told you he knew where they were. Well, he goes and finds them. And he said unto the servant, Behold these. And he beheld the first, that it had brought forth much fruit. And he beheld also that it was good. And he said unto the servant, Ha, take of the fruit thereof, and lay it up against the season that I may preserve it unto mine own self. For behold, said he, this long time have I nourished it, and it hath brought forth much fruit. How oh, the scattering worked. Not just for those who were brought in to replace them, but for those scattered branches of themselves. Look at how well they're growing in these other areas. Now, the lost tribes, well, they're, they're, we call them lost for a reason. I don't know where the nethermost parts of the vineyard are. But this suggests that some good things have been happening. There, and in my own life, I've noticed that sometimes being a minority, off in some distant territory, can be a good thing to revitalize you, to jumpstart some additional spiritual growth. I'm no longer taking this for granted just because everyone around me quote-unquote believes the same thing. No, I've been scattered to some other place. It's woken me up or awakened me to the value of what I have. I've, I've awakened from cultural Christianity back to covenant Christianity. Or in the old House of Israel version, from just going through the motions as a card-carrying member of the House of Israel to truly being part of the Abrahamic covenant. In thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And I'm all in to go bless those families. No wonder I'm blessed in return. Right? But then notice what happens in 21 and 22. It came to pass that the servant said unto his master, How comest thou hither to plant this tree? or this branch of the tree. Behold, it was the poorest spot in all the land of thy vineyard. It's like, it's a good thing you wrote things down on the map because I never would have come out here to look for it. It's like searching for the Garden of Eden in the middle of central Nevada. No offense to those in central Nevada. But uh, you'll probably admit yourself that there are some poorer spots of land and yet you're growing in incredible ways. Maybe that's part of the pruning process. There's not much else here rather, rather, other than sinking down the taproot as far as we can go. It's the only way we'll survive out here. And it's interesting to watch some people absolutely flourish in difficult circumstances. And the Lord in his wisdom placed them in a place that leaves other people scratching their heads. Like, why on earth would you have somebody there? Why would you make them go through that? Why? What are you, what are you thinking? And yet notice the Lord's response to his <laughs> bewildered servant. The Lord of the vineyard said unto him, Counsel me not. I knew that it was a poor spot of ground. I mean, I've been doing this a lot longer than you have. I know what, what good ground looks like. I know what poor soil looks like. Like again, the parable of the sower, I can spot it from a mile away. Wherefore I said unto thee, I have nourished it this long time. And thou beholdest that it hath brought forth much fruit. <laughs> Knowing what the soil would be like, I knew what the nourishment would require. I, I'm a God who believes in compensatory blessings. 
that there's no single place where it's absolutely impossible to grow, I will more than make it up to you. Sometimes if it's a dry climate, trees are forced to sink their roots down deeper. And even there's something about God asking us to pray for rain instead of simply relying on a river that always seems to flow. Most, I've mentioned this before in other, other years, but most of Earth's civilizations have grown up around rivers. Makes sense. You're dependent on water, not just to drink, but for your plants and animals to drink as well. So let's, ha let's live in the fertile crescent, fertile because of its waterways. Let's, uh, let's start things in Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. That's what Mesopotamia means. Tigris, Euphrates, civilization. Nile, civilization. Amazon, civilization. It, it, Mississippi, it's all these places where there are rivers that cities tend to crop up. And yet, where does the Lord send Abraham? Jerusalem, Israel. The Jordan River doesn't even count because it's a rift valley away. It's hard to come down from Jerusalem to go. You're not, you're not fill, filling up your buckets like that, okay? And what about Salt Lake? Yeah, a few at City Creek. <laughs> but a desert that had not yet blossomed as the rose. And to me, there's something significant about God setting up his, his people in places where they're going to have to rely upon the rain. They're going to have to pray for it. They're not going to be able to coast along without irrigating, without pleading with a God of weather to send some raindrops. I, I hope that makes sense. If you are one that's asking yourself the same question that the servant did, God, why on earth would you expect, how could you expect me to grow in a place like this or at a time like this or in a family like this or in a marriage like this or with, with parents like that or how do you expect me to bring forth fruit with kids like that whatever it is we tend to complain we tend to worry we tend to criticize we tend to shake our fists heavenward wondering why we weren't planted in the garden of eden well on the one hand we're all east of eden by now but on the other hand God gets it, and he makes up for it by constantly offering his nourishing care. Look for that. See his hand. Recognize where the water's coming from. Maybe it's not water table. Maybe it's irrigation from above. Think about that when you read the next few verses, 23, 24. It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Look hither. Behold, I have planted another branch of the tree also, and thou knowest that this spot of ground was poorer than the first. <laughs> what you thought was bad, well, it might not be as bad as you thought. There may be even worse conditions elsewhere. It's all relative. But behold the tree, the Lord says. Just look at this thing. I have nourished it this long time. It hath brought forth much fruit. Therefore gather it. Lay it up against the season, that I may preserve it unto mine own self. Again, long-term results, not just short-term. And then came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said again unto his servant, Look hither, and behold another branch also, which I have planted. Behold, that I have nourished it also, and it hath brought forth fruit. That's the way the Lord works. He nourishes and things grow. Whatever the Lord touches, he brings to life. And what's amazing here is the Lord of the vineyard, the Lord of the harvest, he knows what he's doing. Trust him. Counsel me not. Jacob had said that earlier. Don't counsel the Lord. Seek counsel from his hand. Uh, we're just servants at best in this, in this garden, in this vineyard. And so to go to the Lord and say, well, you really messed up there. He's like, what? Just stick around, okay? You, you might learn a thing or two, apprentice, Padawan. <laughs> Come to and watch, and pretty soon we're like, wow, the Lord really understands what he's doing. God is the gardener here, right, Hubie Brown? It reminds me, actually, of something Jesus said to his apostles shortly before leaving them in Gethsemane and Calvary. 
This is John chapter 15, verse 16, one of my favorites for anyone who's trying to serve the Lord, where he says, Ye have not chosen me. How's that for putting the apostles in their place? But I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. I bet even they wondered, like, why would you pick me? I'm a lousy plot of ground. I'm a mere fisherman, a tax collector. I don't know what I'm doing. And the Lord can say, that's all right. This is a pretty rough spot of ground. Uh, Israel hasn't grown here very well, very long. And yet, who become the first apostles? Members of the house of Israel. And then think about going further beyond and like, what's ever going to become of that one as they were scattered far by the Assyrians, as they were carried captive by the Babylonians. Oh, just you wait. And even in those far flung areas, I am nourishing and they are, they're becoming something. Just, just you wait. And then he gives them one last, I mean, these are things we can't put geographic names to. Again, the nethermost parts of the vineyard. I don't know where all the lost tribes were scattered, but God is doing good things with them. Okay? But then verse 25, we do know the location of this one, roughly. 25, he said unto the servant, look hither and behold the last. We've been looking at all kinds of other scattered branches, but let's check this last one I've really been keeping my eye on. Behold, this have I planted in a good spot of ground. So this is a place that you probably would have assumed great growth would come. And sure enough, that's true, but only partly so. Good spot of ground, a new land of promise, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Where do you think this one is? Where do you think this scattered branch was replanted? I found a good spot of ground. I've nourished it this long time. But only a part of the tree hath brought forth tame fruit. The other part of the tree hath brought forth wild fruit. Behold, I've nourished this tree like unto the others. This one almost seems to leave the Lord of the vineyard scratching his head. So no wonder the servant would be confused as well. It's like, what happened here? All these places where people were struggling, are places where you won't, wouldn't think to find any growth at all, and yet they took on the Lord's nourishment. They must have known they needed it. There, there's no water coming from anywhere else. So if you got any living water, I'll take every drop. This is dry farming. Well, what about the ones that are planted in such a glorious place, right by the river, that they don't think they have to sink their roots very deep? That it's easy to produce massive quantities of fruit and lull yourself into a false sense that, that quality doesn't really matter. Again, this is the currant bush. Look at me. Look at how big my branches are. Eh, that's not what you're for, little currant bush. Who, where are we talking about? Land of promise. Good ground. Nourished by God. And yet kind of half and half results. On the same tree? Again, yeah, I'd, I'd be scratching my head too. Same tree, some tame, some wild. Well, sound like Lehi's family being transplanted to the ultimate good spot of ground, nourished by God himself. We've got brass plates to keep prophets adding and adding living water. And yet, how did you turn out? Well, mixed results. And you have Nephites versus Lamanites, and now wars and contentions and struggle between them. You've got tame and wild at, at odds and at arms against one another. How is this happening? It's interesting to see different people responding to different situations in different ways, but also different people responding to the same situation in different ways. You want to talk about the nurture-nature debate. I've been nurturing them all the same way. It's the same tree. It's the same family. We're all growing up in the same spot, and I'm doing the very best I can by all of them, and yet some are responding in positive ways and others are responding in negative. Tame and wild right here under the same roof. How is this happening? I know some of us parents have wondered the same thing. Well, go to verse 26. What's the Lord going to do from here? It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto the servant, Pluck off the branches that have not brought forth good fruit, and cast them into the fire. I mean, he's ready to pass final judgment here. 
But behold, the servant said unto him, ah, let, let, let us prune it, please. Don't, don't give up yet. Let's dig about it. Let's nourish it a little longer. That perhaps, uh, no guarantees on my side either, but I've watched how you've done it. I've seen your, your faith and gradual growth. I, I've watched the process unfold, and I trust your power and your process and your pace. Actually, I'm trying to extend that pace a bit. I'm reminding you of what you taught me originally, and please can we be patient, that perhaps it may bring forth good fruit unto thee, that thou canst lay it up against the season. Now I'll admit, that was gutsy of, on the part of the servant to, to question. He was just told, counsel me not, and yet here he is finding himself counseling the Lord. <laughs> but not a matter of counsel in terms of how you've treated things and how you've run things. I'm not questioning the economy of thy kingdom, but I am wondering if we might still have a little time. Uh, I'm looking for the, the clouds on the horizon. I'm, I'm checking the temperature and the, the weather forecast, and it doesn't seem like winter is quite here yet. Can we wait a little longer before harvest time? And the Lord decides, mm, okay. Let's do it. It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard and the servant of the Lord of the vineyard did nourish all the fruit of the vineyard. Let's keep going. Let's keep working. It's been working in so many other places. It was half working here. So let's keep at it. Let's keep digging and pruning and nourishing and giving it all we can. And we'll do it to all the vineyard. God is no respecter of persons. All are blessed by God. All are given second chances. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun shines all across the vineyard. And I love the thought of a servant, a prophet, and some kind of intercessor, intermediary, pleading with the Lord of the vineyard on behalf of these trees. Maybe they've come to love the trees as much as the Lord of the vineyard does having worked with them this long time. Maybe these are things that the Lord always intended to do and was just testing these servants. Are you as impatient as I'm pretending to be? Have you lost sight of the goodness of roots and the potential of branches? Are you ready to give up on these people? There were some times when Moses was ready. Remember that in the Old Testament study? And yet when the Lord finally says, fine, then let's just chuck it. Let's just start everything over with you. You can be my new Adam. And Moses is like, oh, well, actually, let's keep trying. Let's work a little longer. Uh, I was hoping you'd say that, Moses. That's what I've been intending all along. But to prolong their days, to give them more time, don't give up on those you're serving. Don't give up on kids that you're raising. Don't give up on yourself if you're still struggling with the fact that some days I give forth good fruit and other days I'm as wild as any undomesticated plant out there, I think we're all more like the, the Lehite tree, off in that good ground, but not always that good ourselves. Times I just want to give up on myself because I keep slipping back into the same old sin. Times I want to give up because I'm not making the kind of progress I see everyone else around me. Or I'm, I've hit this plateau or this lull. I grew so much on my mission. And since then, it's been stagnant. Or I had such good times as a young parent or a newlywed couple. The creation stage, it was amazing. Well, if I'm now in the fall and I wonder what's become of me. I had good fruit. Now I've got wild fruit. What do I do? Do I just pull the plug and end things now? Do I give up on my marriage? Do I give up on my kids? Do I give up on the gospel? Do I give up on the church? Do I give up on my neighbors and friends? Do I give up on myself? Or do I keep on trying? And again, the courage of the servant to counsel the Lord. Uh -huh. In reality, probably just relying upon the attributes he's already seen within the Lord of the Vineyard. I know you're patient. Will you continue to be for the sake of this tree? Of course he will be. To the point that verse 29 and 30 then allows for 
another change of scenery. The curtains have closed. And in verse 29, it came to pass that a long time had passed away. The third stage then replaces the second. This New Testament time period, like, wow, there are Jews becoming Christians left and right. Even in this poor spot of ground. The Book of Mormon history, we see the Lehite branch planted, transplanted in a new spot. A glorious spot. And yet having mixed results. Long time passes. And now from verse 29 through 51, we'll see the third act unfold. The Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Come, let us go down, let's part the the curtain, and go down into the vineyard, that we may labor again in the vineyard. It's never done. For behold, the time draweth near, the end soon cometh. Ah, we're in this long third stage of the great apostasy, We're getting closer and closer to the end time where something's got to be fixed, something's got to give. But during this long time, the end soon cometh, wherefore I must lay up fruit against the season unto mine own self. The clock is ticking here, brother. It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard and the servant sent down into the vineyard, and they came to the tree whose natural branches had been broken off. And the wild branches had been grafted in, and behold, all sorts of fruit did cumber the tree. And all sorts, like, this, what, what, what kind of tree was this? Did we plant fruit salad? Uh, this is not just one kind or one crop. I'm seeing all kinds of stuff here. Now, remember, this was the, the main one that outsiders came into. Are we seeing Gentiles and Jews coming into the Christian church that was established there with such good results at the end of the second act. But now it's all, it's kind of gone crazy. What has become of Christianity? And now I'm seeing all kinds of, all sorts of fruit cumbering the tree. It's gone gangbusters, but I'm seeing Catholics and, you know, well, Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, and I'm seeing Methodists and, and, and Baptists and Presbyterians and Congregationalists and Lutherans and Calvinists and everything in between. Wow, what a proliferation of fruit. What, what's it like? In verse 31, it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard did taste of the fruit, every sort according to its number. So not just outward appearance. I want inward quality. I'm looking for true taste. And the Lord of the vineyard said, Behold, this long time have we nourished this tree. I have laid up unto myself against the season much fruit. That was all the good news from the second act. But behold, this time it hath brought forth much fruit. But there is none of it which is good. Behold, there are all kinds of bad fruit. And it profiteth me nothing, notwithstanding all our labor. Can you sense the... The sadness there, the frustration, it's not that I just let it go to pot. I tried everything. And now it grieveth me that I should lose this tree. There seems to be apostasy as far as the eye can see. From a religious standpoint, what did the Lord eventually say to Joseph Smith in the first vision? Don't join any of them. There's... The the precepts they're teaching are more commandments of men than true counsel of God. They've lost something. Now, please don't jump to some kind of extreme conclusion and assume, oh yeah, we've got to just chop down the whole tree because there was nothing there. Be careful. Don't you remember the labors and pains and travails of the Jews in bringing forth salvation unto my people? Or the labors and travails and pains of Catholicism and Protestantism and the, and the reformers and all of these incredible people that were nourishing the woman in the wilderness for time and times and half a time. We have to have, we've got to prove contraries here. And understand that, yes, there was an apostasy that required a restoration. But we don't have to paint the apostasy in as dark hues as we typically do. The diamond will still shine beautifully. Okay? even if we have a more accurate backdrop. But what's happening here is this sense of none have the fullness of the gospel. 
there is yet work to be done. We can't just start well and assume that we can just leave it to its own devices and everything's going to go fine from that moment on. There was a period where the trees were growing and some better than others and where have the servants been? Where have true messengers gone? There seems to be famine in the land, not famine for bread or water, but for hearing the word of God. There seems to have been a falling away first, like Paul prophesied. And what's happening here in my vineyard? Now, verse 33, the Lord has a question. The Lord of the vineyard said unto the servant, What shall we do unto the tree? I'm at a loss here. And this is ironic that omniscience would would second guess, would wonder, would ask that, that divinity would ask humanity, what do you think, mere servant? What shall we do unto the tree that I may preserve again good fruit thereof unto mine own self? I do believe that God places incredible confidence in his servants, the prophets, and wants them to exercise their agency, wants them to do their homework and grow up in God. True apprentices here. Real work. So what do you think we should do? I'm, I'm honoring agency as well as providing inspiration. But there's a contrary there. So what do you think? And the servant said unto his master, Well, behold, because thou didst graft in the branches of the wild olive tree. I mean, that was good at first. They have nourished the roots, right? They are alive. They have not perished. Wherefore thou beholdest that they are yet good. So there's, there's strength there in those roots. And it's those roots that gave strength to the branches, but also the branches that gave nourishment to the roots. We really are in this thing together. It's one tree, right? And so to think about it going in both directions and the roots needed to bless the branches because they can pull things up from the soil, but the branches needed to strengthen the roots because... They're the ones giving forth leaves to get the energy from the sun in photosynthesis. Strength from above, strength from below. There's some contraries being proven. And coming together to help the tree in its entirety. If you think about this historically first, the Jews needed the Gentiles to reinfuse some new life into the church. But the Gentiles needed the Jews because that's where the Abrahamic covenant's coming from. Right? Think about all that Nephi was doing with the words of Isaiah. All he was doing, coupling it with his panoramic visions of the last days. And the Jews are going to need the Gentiles to remind them of the covenant that they've strayed from. But the Gentiles are going to need the Jews because there's no other way for the Gentiles to come into the covenant. They don't get a covenant of their own. They are adopt they're grafted into the tree. They're becoming a part of it. They're waking up the roots, but then the roots are blessing them in return. I love that it goes both directions. Jews will need Gentiles. Gentiles will need Jews. Nephites will need Lamanites, and Lamanites will need Nephites. Think about what Jacob was doing, drawing upon the positive example of the Lamanites. Think about what will happen in the role reversal in Helaman when Samuel the Lamanite is calling Nephites to repentance. The sons of Mosiah, well, the anti-Nephi-Lehi's needed the Nephite sons of Mosiah. But the conversion of those Lamanites saved the church. Those stripling warriors saved the armies of the Nephites. The influx of that incredible righteousness gave Nephites something to shoot for as far as their own obedience was concerned. In our day, could we say that members need non-members and non-members need mem members? Could we say that Republicans need Democrats and Democrats re need Republicans? Can we say the left needs the right and the right needs the left and the top needs the bottom and the bottom needs the top and that God cares about the entire tree? Can we say that? Can we say that old, established, pioneer stock members need new converts? to re-infuse them and re-enthuse them of the glories of the gospel. It's fresh and new for them, and it reminds me of how incredible this is. At the same time, do these new converts need the lifelong members to help them understand what a deep and powerful tradition the gospel of Jesus Christ offers? 
Oh, roots and branches, we're in this together. We need it all, right? So with that, look at verse 35. It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, The tree profiteth me nothing. The roots thereof profit me nothing, so long as it shall bring forth evil fruit. Now again, he's not going back to his earliest moment where it's like, ah, who cares about the tree? It's all about the fruit. But part of the challenge here is the fruit is required. If both sides need each other, then ends and means are both essential. But if all we're dealing with, all we're focusing on is means and we're missing the ends, then then something's wrong with the means too. Okay? I'm after fruit, and unfortunately, everywhere I look, it's problematic. This is the great apostasy. I've never seen so many problems. But something's got to give here. Something's got to change because fruit is not forthcoming. He says, nevertheless, I know that the roots are good. There he is so quick to come back going, oh, but I still love the whole tree. The roots, they're, they're solid. They were doing amazing things. I know the roots are good, and for my own purpose I have preserved them. And because of their much strength, they have hitherto brought forth from the wild branches good fruit. That's how strong these roots were. They could somehow change wild into tame, bad into good, wicked into righteous. This is the transformation that comes through the atonement of Jesus Christ. To take on a new nature having overcome the natural man or woman within. But please remember, it's not about what the trees and the roots are in and of themselves. It's what they can produce when they work together. It's what happens when oh, old experiences fuse with new insights, and all of a sudden, man, it's... First shelf is leading to second shelf as God is bringing down things from third shelf. And I'm, I'm on fire again. I'm bringing forth fruit like I haven't in a long time. I see that in my own students that caught fire in the mission field and then plateaued in the first few years of coming home. And then dive back into the scriptures like they hadn't in years and seen fruit that rekindles that missionary momentum. It's a beautiful thing to watch. But again, in the context here, I love that the Lord is basically saying the roots are inherently good, even if they seem to be struggling to produce good fruit right now. Judaism is inherently good. Christianity, traditional Christianity, inherently good. Remember their labors and pains and travails. They're bringing forth salvation unto you. And even though salvation seems to have stalled during the apostasy, oh, don't, go, don't give up on, on it. Hold on to what these roots have produced. They can yet produce good fruit. But that does still leave me wondering, what went wrong? Things were so good at the end of the second scene. What happened here? We need to do some, some analysis. We've got to figure out what went wrong so we can try to avoid it in the future. And so in verse 37, they're starting to make sense of things. Behold, the wild branches have grown and have overrun the roots thereof. That seems to be the big problem. In fact, that would explain why, how the roots can still be good and yet not producing very well. The wild branches have gone gangbusters. It's almost like the, the roots were so good, they brought life and it sprung to life, but pretty soon that life is transferring upward at the expense of what's going on downward. These wild branches have gone haywire. They've overrun the roots thereof. And because of the wild branches have overcome the roots thereof, it hath brought forth much evil fruit. And because that it hath brought forth so much evil fruit, thou beholdest that it beginneth to perish, and will soon become ripened, that it may be cast into the fire. Except we should do something for it, to preserve it. I love there's still hope. I mean, if we don't do anything from here, then yes, the current bush is a goner. But pull out the pruning shears, Elder Brown, and, and you'll see some hope rekindled except we should do something. We've got to try. What's been going on, again, let's go historical for a moment. 
What happened when Gentiles began to be grafted in to the Christian church? This is all that we studied last year in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, and then into the letters of Paul, where Paul, the great missionary to the Gentiles, was so focused on wild branches. He grafted like no one ever had before. And he was a master grafter. He brought them in, made them a part of things, even pushed back against Peter when Peter was a little concerned, like, but what's this doing to the roots? We're seeing some friction between roots and branches, and how are we going to do this? And you get someone like, like James in Jerusalem trying to figure out how to navigate that as well. All of that at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, all that stuff from last year. This is what's going on right now in the allegory of the olive tree. And yet, every time... Paul would go to some new place, scattered branches off across the Roman Empire. He'd check on the natural branches and realize they weren't bringing forth good fruit. I go to the synagogue and I preach Jesus as the fulfillment of every messianic prophecy, and they have no ears to hear. Hmm, there's all kinds of fruit here, but it's cumbering and not, not bringing the kind of good fruit that we're going to lay up in store for the season. Well, he turns from the Jewish synagogue to the Gentile marketplace and begins to preach and find incredible success. Right? All of that we saw to the point that within a few generations, it's more of a gen Christianity is more of a Gentile church than a Jewish church. To the point that the Jews even have to say, oh, well, quit calling yourself Jews. You're not the house of Israel as we see it. We're going to have to give you a different name. So what's called, you believe in Christ? Fine, you're the Christians. Christians, however you want to pronounce it. Okay, we can take that. We'll, we'll own that. But the, the Jewish, the Christian church, the center of gravity shifts. And as a result, I don't know if you saw this in your mission. If you were in a place where the church was small and young, and people... It was built mostly on the, ba on the backs of brand new converts, which is so much life and so much growth and so much enthusiasm. But without r the roots of this is how things are done in the church and, and this is how, and again, not just cultural, but like real covenant, there's depth here and there's experience here. And so sometimes in a new convert's enthusiasm, they don't know what to hold on to from the old, what to how to transition into the new, it's, it, it can be tricky. Old habits die hard. Old traditions are oh, difficult to overcome sometimes. And to see the, the, the Christian chaos, for lack of a better phrase, that came about during the years of the great apostasy, because they'd cut themselves off from their covenant roots in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The New Testament seemed to have separated itself from the old in ways that were never intended. Plain and precious parts were lost as they no longer were viewing Old and New Testament as a new and everlasting testament, a new and everlasting covenant with God's house of Israel. Does that make sense? This is what's going on right here, right now, in this time period of the allegory. And so no wonder the Lord of the vineyard and his servants are saying, we got to do something about this. Okay, we can't let it stay this way. It's only going to get worse. So verse 38, it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, let us go down into the nethermost parts of the vineyard. And behold, if the natural branches have also brought forth evil fruit. We were seeing what's happening right here at headquarters. Let's go back to where Israel's been scattered. Maybe they've still been strong because remember, they had to like stand up for themselves. They, they couldn't take for granted the gospel because cultural Christianity didn't exist where they were. Okay? It had to remain covenant Christianity. So let's go check on the nethermost. It came to pass that they went down into the nethermost part of the vineyard, and it came to pass that they beheld that the fruit of the natural branches had become ah, corrupt also. Really? Yea, the first and the second and also the last, they had all become corrupt? Darn it. Lost. The lost tribes are truly lost now. They're lost spiritually. They have no sense of identity. They don't even remember who they are as children of the covenant. And then maybe saddest of all for him, as he's gone through all these nethermost parts, all the poor spots of ground, and yet, finally, the best spot, the choice land, notice what happens here. 
and the wild fruit of the last hath overcome that part of the tree which brought forth good fruit, even that the branch had withered away and died. Even there, the Lamanites finally overcame the Nephites. And by the end of the Book of Mormon, that wasn't based on lineage or what we might call in modern lingo race. It wasn't like that. Everything fused into one in 4th Nephi. And when it broke again into factions, into ites, it had nothing to do with, with, with genealogy. It had everything to do with whether or not you wanted to follow God. Lamanites in the second part, or the end part of the Book of Mormon, were Lamanite, Lamanites by choice, not by birth. And they just, the, their wicked natures overcame the righteous natures. And eventually the wicked overcame the righteous entirely until the Book of Mormon came to crashing to its close in a moment like this in the allegory. With the Lord of the Vineyard, again, weeping and grieving over what happened here. I planted it in the best spot. I nourished it with all that it needed. And it was mixed results for a while but instead of the good overcoming the bad, the bad overcame the good. How could we have allowed that to happen? You get a sense of that grief in the next two verses. 41 and 42. It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard wept and said unto the servant, What could I have done more for my vineyard? There is a moment of deep oh, pathos here. This is sorrow. This is grief. This is... Self-reflection and self-questioning. What could I have done more for my vineyard? Do you sense regret there? Do you sense some pain? Could I have done anything differently? This is omniscience racking its brain. This is omnipotence having tried everything but wondering if they could have tried something else. Justice, mercy, everything in between. What else could I have done? Behold, I knew that all the fruit of the vineyard, save it were these, had become corrupted. And now these which have once brought forth good fruit have also become corrupted, and now all the trees of my vineyard are good for nothing, save it be to be hewn down and cast into the fire. That's it. I would never intended to grow firewood. But is that where we are? I even wonder if he's second-guessing himself here because that last tree, the one in the best spot, best potential, I was putting all my eggs over there. And I let the bad grow alongside the good. You counseled me, servant, to wait a little longer. Should I have? This is, this is a, a, an interesting moment. Vulnerability on the part of God. And I wonder there, as, as he's second-guessing himself in this instance, what was I supposed, should I have just cut off the Lamanites at the start? Makes you wonder about Lehi and Nephi. Should I have let Laman and Lemuel just go home? Back to Jerusalem, back to the land of their inheritance, where they would inherit nothing but destruction when the Babylonians came. Bad for them, but would have been good for us? Should we have lopped off those bad branches and just hunkered down in ourselves? But then again, you hear Lehi say, I couldn't do that to my sons. And Nephi say, I couldn't do that to my brothers. We're in this thing together. We're one tree. This, in some ways, is now the parable of the wheat and tares. We've seen hints of parable of the sower. Now lean into the parable of the wheat and tares. And there's good and bad growing in the same field. There's... Lane, there's tame and wild on the same tree. And what's the Lord say? It's the, it's, flip it. It's the opposite. It's interesting. Because here is the servant. Wait a little longer. Let's keep trying. In there, it's the servant's chomping in the bit. Like, let's go, let's go weed the garden and eliminate the tares. And the Lord says, ah, can you even tell the difference? That's a tough one. Can you tell which branches are good and which ones are, are evil, which are, are tame and which are wild? And especially in a tree that seems to be changing, some are tapping into the strength of the root evidently better than others, but the fact it's happening at all means it could happen elsewhere. So wait, you, you pull out the weeds, you're going to end up pulling out the wheat. 
you don't always know the difference. So yes, let's tarry a little longer. Let's wait. Let's postpone judgment day. The good just might overcome the bad. It happens. And yet here, oh, darn it, the opposite was true. It's an interesting challenge. The Lord is always trying to navigate. Speed things up, slow things down. We saw that with Lehi's words about God had to lengthen the time so we'd have time to repent. But then you get Matthew 24 and Joseph Smith Matthew. Unless those last days are shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. What do I do? Speed up or slow down? Lengthen or constrict? I don't know. Well, God, in his perfect judgment, is still at the mercy of our agency. And will we use the time he gives us to repent? Or will we keep procrastinating the day of our repentance until it's everlastingly too late? These are real issues we're wrestling with. How, how do I, what do I do when, in a mixed faith marriage? What do I do when some of my children are strong and others are, have left and left angrily and bitterly and are now trying to affect their other siblings? What do I do? What do I do in a ward that has such a political divide or clicks with, with old timers and newcomers? And how do we do this? I'm so grateful for a Lord of the Vineyard that is willing to work with us. But we have to be willing to work with him. Now, what does some of that work entail? Let's keep reading and see. Verse 43, Behold this last, whose branch hath withered away, I did plant in a good spot of ground. He's lamenting over the Lamanites and Nephites here. New land of promise. This is centered on the Book of Mormon. Yea, even that which was choice unto me, above all other parts of the land of my vineyard, that's this new promised land. And thou beheldest that I also cut down that which cumbered this spot of ground. Think about that. I preserved it for a chosen people. It wasn't overrun with. I mean, this was new land, right? And they came. Lehi came and wow, it's all tailor-made for me. I did it that I might plant this tree in the stead thereof. And thou beheldest that a part thereof brought forth good fruit, that was usually the Nephites, a part thereof brought forth wild fruit, that was usually the Lamanites, and because I plucked not the branches thereof and cast them into the fire, behold, they have overcome the good branch that it hath withered away. That's all this questioning and second-guessing himself that I mentioned just a moment ago. Should I have shortened the days when I ended up lengthening them? Should I have passed final judgment or given them more chances to repent? I think we're always second-guessing ourselves with that. It's so hard to know. Well, verse 46, Now behold, notwithstanding all the care which we, you and me, servants, which we have taken of my vineyard, the trees thereof have become corrupted. Again, apostasy as far as the eye can see. They bring forth no good fruit. And these ah, I had hoped to preserve, to have laid up fruit thereof against the season unto mine own self. But behold, they have become like unto the wild olive tree, and they are of no worth but to be hewn down and cast into the fire. And it grieveth me that I should lose them. But what could I have done more in my vineyard? Have I slackened mine hand that I have not nourished it? Nay, I have nourished it. I have digged about it. I have pruned it. I have dunged it. I have stretched forth mine hand almost all the day long. And the end draweth nigh. Again, there's omnipotence looking for things he left undone. Omniscience second-guessing himself. And it grieveth me that I should hew down all the trees of my vineyard and cast them into the fire, that they should be burned. Who is it that has corrupted my vineyard? I know it's not my fault. Even though I'm trying to look for any evidence of blame I can take, it's a Lord, is it I, that even the Lord himself is asking. Racking his brain for different ways he could have gone about it. But there's nothing there. I, I never slacken my hand. The God of Israel slumbers not nor sleeps. He gives everything he possibly can. 
So who could have possibly done it? That's actually the question in the parable of the wheat and tares. Who has corrupted my land? And they realize, ah, an enemy hath done this. In that parable, it's the evil one going around planting weeds among the wheat, plant, sowing tares. But what's interesting about this parable, it, there doesn't seem to be a, a visible opposition here. It seems to be much more natural growth or natural decay. Oh, natural man, or taking upon us the divine nature. So who is the enemy? Who has corrupted the vineyard? I guess the answer can only be the vineyard itself. That's where I start asking, Lord, is it I? For my own mistakes, my own sinfulness. I was raised by goodly parents. I was taught. I was raised in the gospel with prophets teaching me, nourishing I was digged and dunged, and I was nourished left and right. And if I'm falling short, I, I guess I have to look inward and see what more I could do to grow. God can't think of anything more he could have done to help us grow. And so, verse 48, the servant is left to try again and to counsel him who he must not counsel. Now, there's no counsel here, but it's more maybe just insight. And we, again, who are we to give insight to omniscience? Or is it the Lord just allowing us to try to wrestle with things and figure things out on our own? But I love what the servant figures out. Verse 48. It came to pass that the servant said unto his master, Well, here's a possibility. Is it not the loftiness of thy vineyard? Have not the branches thereof overcome the roots which are good? He's right. This is what we saw earlier. But this is where it, where it dawns on the servant. He says, Because the branches have overcome the roots thereof, behold, they grew faster than the strength of the roots, taking strength unto themselves. Behold, I say, is not this the cause that the trees of thy vineyard have become corrupted? Don't blame yourself and don't blame some outward enemy. I just think this is kind of natural growth that once trees start to grow and it's like, hey, there's more light up there. Let's go gangbusters without an intentional pruning back and digging down and deciding how we're going to balance things above and beneath the soil, this is just what's going to end up happening naturally. We get, we're visible creatures. We seem to care more about the, the branches we can see than the branches, than the roots that we can't. Does that make sense? And so, hey, if these are the things, I, and I can do this, and I can show that, and it's all the visible and tangible, oh, there's, I, I get street cred. I become the Joneses that everybody wants to keep up with. But like the slow slog of growing, of deepening roots, nobody notices that. The kinds of things that go on behind the scenes to strengthen my spiritual foundation who cares about the foundation? I want us, the people to see the building on top. But, ooh, careful. <laughs> it rests on that foundation. And if the foundation is flawed, then the building will topple. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. Don't you think, Lord of the Vineyard? And that's exactly right. In fact, here is another good spot to pause and review our senses of Scripture. Because if we're reading literally, then what's the problem? Well, too much height and not enough depth. This is exactly what Hubie Brown's current bush was dealing with in I Am the Gardener here. Okay, if we're sticking with a garden lesson, uh, make sure the roots are, are counterbalancing the branches. Now move forward to the second sense of Scripture, the allegorical. This is what Zenos was after, right? Well, the Gentile expansion came at Jewish expense. It moved Christianity away from its roots in the Abrahamic covenant. I, I wouldn't blame the Gentiles for this. They found something glorious in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they came rushing in. But unfortunately, they brought in their Greek philosophy with them. And that, oh, New Testament Christianity passing through Greek philosophy definitely comes out different on the other side. If we're looking at the moral sense of Scripture... How does this become a problem in my personal life? Well, is this innovation at the expense of tradition? 
Am I like those philosophers on Mars Hill in Acts 18 or 17? Am I hungering for some new thing while totally ignoring the small and simple truths of the gospel? Ah, I've outgrown the primary answers. Give me the mysteries. Oh, and you've outgrown faith and repentance and covenant commitment? Oh, be careful. Or the anagogical sense? The last days potential problems that we face? Is there a danger of the church compromising with modern culture? I mean, if we want to become popular in the eyes of the world, if we want to be the biggest church on the planet, then let's grow even if it comes at the expense of goodness. Forget our roots in the past. Let's just move boldly into the future and not look back. Oh, there's danger there. There's a comp that there's a a contrary we have to prove. In some places, we might have to slow down church growth, make it a little slower and a little steadier so that it's sustainable, and make sure that there is local leadership with enough experience to be able to handle the explosive growth taking place all around us. It's one of the reasons that Elder Holland, or President Holland, was area president in Chile 20 years ago, and why Elder President Oaks was area president in the Philippines. Chile and the Philippines were places of expanse, just rapid expansion, explosive growth, and it was more branch than root. And so there were stakes in name only that didn't have the depth of, of commitment to be able to counterbalance and help strengthen all the converts that were flooding into the church. We learned some things in Chile. We learned some things in the Philippines. And we better have learned those lessons as the church is now exploding in Africa. What will happen as other parts of the world currently closed to missionary work finally open? We have to learn the challenges, the lessons of rapid growth. And Jacob 5 is teaching those things to us. How do we make sure the roots are strong even as the branches are expanding? Okay. Well, we're getting close to the end of this third act. We see it come to what we might call a close. This is a tough one to, to specify. But read 49 through 51, and we're sort of coming to an end of this apostasy stage. It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto the servant, Let us go to and hew down the trees of the vineyard. Cast them into the fire. It's like, that's it. But we're done. It didn't work. And we got to stop. We're going to cut, we're going to cut our losses and just end things. We're going to burn it down that it shall not cumber the ground of my vineyard for I have done all. That's the right answer to the question. He now repeats, what could I have done more for my vineyard? The answer is nothing. Omniscience thought of everything. Omnipotence did all within its power. But then again, maybe there is one more thing God can do. Wait. Give it more time. Let patience have her perfect work, as James says. Well, like the servant had already said in a previous scene, can we just wait and see? Here again, he repeats it. Behold, the servant said unto the Lord of the vineyard, Spare it a little longer. And the Lord said, Fine. Yea, I will spare it a little longer, for it grieveth me that I should lose the trees of my vineyard. I love that God is willing to be persuaded, that he sees our faith and will respond to it, that he is willing to enter into a real relationship with give and take and fellow counsel and coming to compromises and deciding together. It's not God holding us on the puppet strings. It's not, it's not fake agency. It's the real thing. And I love that he's willing to let us intercede God is a God of mercy, and that mercy always seems to respond to the point that we now have a fourth stage beginning to open, a fourth act. I didn't even see the, 
curtains close and then reopen, but it seems like things are now moving in a different direction. God was really ready to pull the final curtain, just close it down. It ends as a tragedy, and everything's in smoke and ashes in this former, this former olive yard, this vineyard that brought forth no good fruit. But let's wait. Spare it. And so verse 52 seems to be the beginning of the final scene, the final act of restoration. Wherefore, let us take of the branches of these, which I have planted in the nethermost parts of my vineyard, and let us graft them into the tree from whence they came. I mean, they started there. We then scattered them, but let's bring them back, shall we? Let's graft them back in. I mean, if we can, bring, if we can graft Gentiles into Judaism, surely we can graft Jews back into Judaism right? Surely we can find lost Israel and help them be found. So let's try it. Let us pluck from the tree those branches whose fruit is most bitter, the one that just seems to be completely beyond redemption, and graft in the natural branches of the tree in the stead thereof. You get it? We're, we're gathering scattered Israel. We're bringing the original branches back home. This will I do that the tree may not perish, that perhaps... There's a gamble again. I may preserve unto myself the roots thereof for mine own purpose. Oh, maybe this could work. Oh, keep your fingers crossed, servants. Let's give it our best shot. Let's try it. There is within traditional Christianity a new theological movement that's called open theology. And open theology is fascinating. Uh, those evangelical theologians that are wrestling with it are the first to admit to their fellow born-again Christians, I know this sounds blasphemous, but believe me, it's biblical. And when I read their material, it's like, oh yeah, not, of course it's biblical. It doesn't sound blasphemous at all to me. What you think is so cutting edge is stuff I learn in primary. That God answers prayers, that he's a God of passions and of emotions and feelings, that he honors agency and is willing to be moved. Because traditional Christianity has labeled God the unmoved mover. He's in charge. Radical sovereignty on, on the part of divinity. And so he moves everything, but is completely unmoved by anything that we might ask or do. He's the unmoved mover. One of my favorite books on open theology is called The Most Moved Mover. And it wasn't written by a Latter-day Saint. It's someone wrestling with the thought, maybe God really does respond to us. Maybe it's not all set out in stone from the, from the beginning, and he's willing to work with us and be moved by us and emotionally engage with us Wow, maybe there really is a partnership between God and humanity. Huh, you mean kind of like a covenant relationship? Yeah. We learned it in primary, my friends. But the world is starting to see it themselves and lay hold of it. So it's fascinating. And here you see such a powerful example of just that. But keep reading, verse 54. Behold, the roots of the natural branches of the tree, which I planted, whithersoever I would, are yet alive. This is the woman nourished in the wilderness. The Bible is still out there. It's providing life-giving strength. The roots are good. Wherefore, that I may preserve them also for mine own purpose, I will take of the branches of this tree. I will graft them in unto them. Yea, I will graft in unto them the branches of their mother tree. And anytime I hear that phrase, it'll come up several more times. But the mother tree, I always think of the tree of life. Remember, Nephi sees the vision. He sees the mother of the Son of God according to the flesh. He sees the tree of life bearing fruit of the love of God. Oh, to bring it all back to where it started? I mean, if Gentile grafts can wake up the roots, what would Jewish grafts do to them? How oh, to be tapped, to tap back into the Abrahamic covenant, to, for them to fully remember who they really are? Ah, do that, and yes, I may preserve the roots also unto mine own self, that when they shall be sufficiently strong, perhaps they may bring forth good fruit unto me, and I may yet have glory in the fruit of my vineyard. 
Wow, God wants to save everything. Roots, fruits, and everything in between. He's just waiting for us to gain sufficient strength. And that will come through His sufficient grace. To bring ourselves back to those old primary answers. Those things, those habits, those things that we developed as missionaries or in our youth and to go back to our first love, as the book of Revelation describes, and fall in love all over again. Wouldn't that revitalize a marriage? Wouldn't that re-enthuse an old convert that now becomes born again again? It's amazing what can happen when, when you go back to your roots, when you resurrect what got you started in the first place. That seems to be what's happening here. And then verse 55, it came to pass that they took from the natural tree, which had become wild, and grafted in unto the natural trees, which had also become wild. Somehow we're going to take all these problems and bring it together and, and new life will, will burst forth. They also took of the natural trees, which had become wild, grafted into their mother tree. So there's the gathering of Israel. That's what Isaiah was constantly prophesying. Nephi constantly talking about as well will be brought back. We, a cut-off branch, God has not cast us off forever. He's not forgotten us here. You see, the Lord of the vineyard says to the servant, pluck not the wild branches from the trees, save it be those which are most bitter, and in them ye shall graft according to that which I have said. And there in his infinite mercy, God is only passing judgment on those that have proven themselves completely unwilling to change. And I, I personally can't point to anyone that I know and pass that kind of judgment on them because I don't know them well enough. Okay? I will always hold out hope for anyone because I believe in the power and the process and the pace and the promises of God. Okay? Be patient. And just trust. Verse 58 then, the Lord says to the servant, we will nourish again the trees of the vineyard. We will trim up the branches thereof. It seems like a good haircut here. A little trim, okay? Uh, we're going we're gonna to kind of bring it back in so that it's giving good fruit instead of wild. We're going to balance out what's above the, the ground from what's below. So nourish it, trim it up. Pluck from the trees those branches which are ripened that must perish, cast them into the fire. And this I do, that perhaps the roots thereof may take strength because of their goodness. I know it's always been there. And because of the change of the branches, that the good may overcome the evil. Do we trust that down deep the roots are good? All they need is a little nourishment. We just need to trim back some unnecessary distractions and get back to basics? Do I believe that about myself? Do I believe it about my children or my loved ones? Well, I sure hope so. Do we, are we willing to make some changes? I love that phrase, because of the change of the branches. Forget what's wild and what's tame or what's originally from the mother tree versus what was grafted in later. I, don't, let's not worry about that so much. But change can really change things. <laughs> That's why we don't have lifelong callings in the church. Because changing a branch here and there, and you've served in this calling, and now it's time to be transplanted into another one, or this person's led and taught you, now you need someone else to do the same from their perspective. Change is good. We should embrace it. I love that President Nelson seems to have fully embraced the changing of branches as he's gone through practically every line of the church handbook of instructions and asked to the apostles, what do you think? Keep it? Chuck it? Change it? What do we do? We've got to revitalize everything. And that is happening in this last day of restoration. It's amazing to watch it unfold. In verse 60, because that I have preserved the natural branches and the roots thereof, glad I kept it all, and that I have grafted in the natural branches again into their mother tree, again, that beautiful phrase, and have preserved the roots of their mother tree, that perhaps the trees of my vineyard may bring forth again good fruit, and that I may have joy again in the fruit of my vineyard. And perhaps 
that I may rejoice exceedingly that I have preserved the roots and the branches of the first fruit. There again do you see an emotional God. We saw him grieving over our sins. But to see him rejoicing over our goodness, our new growth, he never gave up on us. He never gave up on his vineyard. So keep trying. Don't give up on yourself or on anybody else. And lean into the emotion of it all. Mourn with those that mourn. But comfort those that stand in need of comfort. Rejoice in the soul that repenteth. And let them rejoice for themselves too. I love the emotion of Jacob 5. No wonder emotional Jacob was drawn to it. I don't want to summarize this stuff. I want to engrave engraven every single word. So bear with me. God bears with us all. He then says in verse 61, Wherefore go to, call servants. This is all hands on deck. We're going to need everybody out here. The harvest is great and the laborers are few, but that's got to change. Okay, So go servant and call fellow servants. That we, we're in this together after all, that we may labor diligently with our might in the vineyard. That we may prepare the way that I may bring forth again the natural fruit. <laughs> I mean, we can help, but when all is said and done, only God can bring about the spiritual growth that we're seeking. Okay, We'll help him prepare the way, but he will bring forth fruit. Which natural fruit is good. And notice this phrase, it should ring some bells. The most precious above all other fruit. I told you we've been hinting at the tree of life here. The love of God, God loving us, and here us loving God, serving alongside him. Wherefore, let us go to and labor with our might this last time. And this time it really will be the last. We're getting to the end of our play here. For behold, the end draweth nigh, and this is for the last time that I shall prune my vineyard. We don't call it the latter days for nothing. But there's work to do in these latter days. Graft in the branches, begin at the last that they may be first, and the first may be last, and dig about the trees, both old and young, the first and the last, the last and the first, that all may be nourished once again for the last time. And this is the last time. These are the last days. These are the final innings. And God is taking things personally into hand. There's something about him serving right alongside us. That was actually my favorite part of the mission. I, as much as I loved my companions, and they were all awesome, my favorite companion was Christ. To just feel that he was filling my mouth when I opened it and guiding me through the spirit of where to go and who to talk to and what to share. It was two years of missionary miracles for me because the Lord was serving alongside me. Better said, he was letting me serve alongside him. Remember what Jesus said to John the Baptist, thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Yeah, you and me, John. Let's go, let's go work. In verse 64, the Lord says to these servants, this growing number of them, wherefore dig about them, prune them, dung them. I love that one. It's like, yep, it's going to be hard stuff. It's going to be redemptive turbulence. It might be some stinky work out there, but it's nourishing. Okay, We're going to fertilize this place. Dung them once more for the last time, for the end draweth nigh. And if, I know it's an if, but let's have faith here. If it be so that these last grafts shall grow and bring forth the natural fruit, then shall ye prepare the way for them that they may grow. It's not, we can't force the growth, but we can prepare the way. Let's do it. Let's trust in this. And as they begin to grow, ye shall clear away the branches which bring forth bitter fruit, according to the strength of the good and the size thereof, and ye shall not clear away the bad thereof all at once, lest the roots thereof should be too strong for the graft, and the graft thereof shall perish, and I lose the trees of my vineyard. Again, this is like the parable of the wheat and the tares. Give it time. Correct, but don't overcorrect. What's interesting here, as we're proving the contraries, is the, you've got to keep things in balance above and beneath the soil, or one side's going to get too strong for the other. 
We already saw the problem of letting the branches go gangbusters and the, the, the roots just couldn't keep up with it. Okay? The tree became so top heavy that it toppled over. That, there's the great apostasy for you. But here's the problem with the opposite extreme. If we chop it all back down to nothing and go scorched earth po uh, uh, policy, are we going to end up killing the roots because there's no photosynthesis coming in because there's no leaves on any branches? Or are the roots going to be so strong, so intense that nothing can end up getting grafted back in? It's like, no, we've got it all we need down here beneath the surface. By the way, I don't know all, I don't know enough about horticulture to understand all the details here. Maybe some of you farmers out there yeah, could teach me a thing or two. I know you could. But to me, it's all about balance. It's, again, that slow and steady, sustainable growth. It's, I'll put it this way. Sometimes I'll meet a student or someone who has just caught fire again. And they're so on fire with the gospel, they want to go scorched earth on their previous lifestyle. And it's, I'm multi-day fasts every week, and I'm at the temple every morning, and I'm studying scripture for hours and hours and hours every day. And it's like, do you have any other things, responsibilities in life? Well, yeah, but I mean, this is what matters most. Yeah. I'm grateful for your zeal, but I'm worried about your overzealousness. You've been too far on one side. And as I've said a million times before, the hardest thing about correcting is not overcorrecting. That's why we've got to prove contraries. We've got to make this sustainable. We've got to allow this to work. So temper your zeal with patience. Okay? Rein in your diligence with temperance. That's what Alma taught Shiblon, right? It's don't run faster than you have strength. I'm not saying, oh, hold on to a few of your sins. But it's slow and steady and you'll get there. Don't demand absolute perfection from day one. In fact, look at what he says in verse 66, because it builds on what we just saw in 64 and 65. It grieveth me that I should lose the trees of my vineyard. There's that deep emotion again. Wherefore, ye shall clear away the bad, but notice how. Clear away the bad according as the good shall grow, that the root and the top may be equal in strength until the good shall overcome the bad, and the bad be hewn down and cast into the fire, that they cumber not the ground of my vineyard, and thus will I sweep away the bad out of my vineyard. That's how we do it. We clear away bad as the good shall grow. To me, there's something powerful about that particular contrary. How do I eliminate darkness in my life? I don't stand at the door and try to shoo it out. No, I just bring in light. And the darkness has to dispel. has no choice. And so I eliminate evil by bringing in good. I don't just chop out bad branches. I replace them. It's not just that I weed the lawn, it's that I reseed the lawn. And as those new seeds are germinating and new grass is growing, the best way to keep a good lawn is to keep it healthy. And it chokes out the weeds whenever they start to grow. Okay? So there's, I actually remember a student once years ago wrestling with a sin he kept slipping into. And he, I'm not his bishop. But he'd already been working with his bishop, and he just came to me to ask for some additional advice. And the more we wrestled with it, I realized, based on, on Zenus's help here in Jacob 5, I said to this young man, I'm like, you know your problem? You're just trying to eliminate your sins. And he's like, that not, doesn't sound like a problem. That's, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? Isn't that what repentance is? I'm like, yeah, but repentance is less about elimination and more about replacement. you got to, uh, you got to bring in the good for the... For it to counteract and force out the bad. So instead of fixating on your sin and I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. Bring in positive things. Clear away the bad according as the good shall grow. Prove contraries. Let root and branch be equal. Because otherwise, what you're trying to do will be undone because it's just plain unsustainable.
you'll never be able to keep up that pace. Slow it down, okay? Then verse 67 through 69, the branches of the natural tree will I graft in again into the natural tree. Then let's say that again for clarification. The branches of the natural tree will I graft into the natural branches of the tree, and thus will I bring them together again. Ooh, there's the gathering of scattered Israel. That they shall bring forth the natural fruit, and they shall be one. That's the focus. Top and bottom, equal in strength, former and current, Gentile, Jew, uh, member, non-member, it's all one. We've got to become one or we are not gods. And the bad shall be cast away, even out of all the land of my vineyard. For behold, only this once will I prune my vineyard. Unity, equality, oneness. How does the Lord define Zion? One heart, one mind dwelling in righteousness with no poor among them. Man, when we can get to that point, there's, there's good ground. There's an amazing harvest. There's fruits laid up for the season. Let's get there. In verse 70, he says, And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard sent his servant. And knowing there was more work than only he could do, the servant went and did as the Lord had commanded him and brought other servants. And they were few, right? The labors are few, though the harvest is great. We've got to keep working on that. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto them, Go to and labor in the vineyard with your might. Give it all you got. For behold, this is the last time that I shall nourish my vineyard. For the end is nigh at hand. The season speedily cometh. And if ye labor with your might with me, ye shall have joy in the fruit which I shall lay up unto myself against the time which shall soon Come. Do you remember that beautiful phrase in Doctrine and Covenants 18? That if you should labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people, and bring, save it be one soul unto me, oh, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of, your, of our Father. It, every tree, even just one little little sapling is worth all the effort to get it where it needs to go. If you are pouring your soul into a child or a spouse or a friend or uh, someone that you're ministering to, joy is what comes when all is said and done. Again, emotion, it's all right there. And like I said, the Lord himself is willing to join us. Verse 72 and 3 it came to pass that the servants did go and labor with their mites, and the Lord of the vineyard labored also with them. Like I said, the personal involvement of the Lord is the best part of serving one another. Ultimate mission companion there, serving alongside. And they did obey the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard in all things. As a result... There began to be the natural fruit again in the vineyard. The natural branches began to grow and thrive exceedingly. The wild branches began to be plucked off and cast away. They did keep the root and the top thereof equal according to the strength thereof. No wonder everything's turning around. It's amazing what can happen when we finally get things right, <laughs> when we keep things balanced, when we prove contraries, when we do things the Lord's way. And what I love about that phrase, on the one hand, he's laboring with us. He's fully engaged. We're allowing him to. We're not stiff-arming him and wanting to do things our way. But the other phrase, they did obey the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard in all things. Let me ask you this question. Just pause for a moment. How's Zenus been doing lately as far as his prophecies being fulfilled? I mean, I'd say he's batting a thousand. And all these details about Gentile growth or the split of the Lehites into Nephite-Lamanite factions and then the bad overcoming the good. And I mean, this is a pretty impressive play laid out. It's a prophetic one. And act after act, scene after scene, it's been going exactly as Zenos said it would. Now, in the latter days, the last time he's sending servants forth into the vineyard, that's our day. And how does he describe it? A day of the Lord's power, or the day of the Lord's personal involvement. Grateful for that reality of the restoration. 
but a day when his servants are willing to obey his commandments in all things. Hmm, when will the Lord come again? When will the harvest be fully ripe? When are we going to figure it out? And fully submit our wills to the will of the Master. I'm, st I'm, I'm not second-guessing you anymore. I'm not here to counsel you. I'm here to follow your commands. This is the stripling warriors that kept every word of command with exactness. And if Zenus's perfect track record follows through, then eventually a generation must grow up in the church willing to do things the Lord's way, to put their will on the altar and give God all they've got. I know students in my own classrooms that are re ready to fulfill that. Uh, we just need more and more of them. Leaven to leaven the lump. That's how we will not only grow, but thrive exceedingly. I know some of you out there are holding on to your faith with white knuckles, or just barely with a fingertip holding on to your membership in the church. I've had some come to me and say, I don't want to just endure or just survive in the church. I don't want to just live the gospel. I want to thrive. I had one student years ago that that was his key word. That's when I'll know I can actually make it. When I can go back to the church with a mentality where I can thrive there. And we worked together for months and months on his questions and issues and concerns and challenges. And after months and months of that, he said, you know, I don't think we need to keep meeting anymore. I'm ready to go back to church and thrive there. Oh, I pray he's still thriving exceedingly. It's amazing. And here we're approaching the end. Not only the end of the chapter and the end of the allegory, but the end of our time here. Before the second coming of Jesus Christ and the millennial reign and the final judgment, in a way we can start pivoting. If you wanted to add a fifth and final scene, it'd be a short one. Just a conclusion. Maybe this is where all the actors come forth to take their bows and we're throwing flowers onto the stage because it's been an incredible production. But notice 74. Thus they labored with all diligence, according to the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard. We're serving with all we've got. We're doing things the Lord's way. Even until the bad had been cast away out of the vineyard. And the Lord had preserved unto himself that the trees had become again the natural fruit. They became like unto one body. The fruits were equal. The Lord of the vineyard had preserved unto himself the natural fruit, which was most precious unto him from the beginning. It's exactly what he'd been working on from the start. Zion. Zion that Enoch pulled off and that we're trying to pull off all over again. May the kingdom of God go forth so the kingdom of heaven may come. Right? Doctrine and Covenant 65. May we become Zion so that we can build Zion. May we be one body. May we all be equal. May we see one another as the most precious fruits of the gospel of Jesus Christ and treat each other that way. This is what prepares the earth for the second coming. This is millennial peace because of the millennial reign of the Prince of Peace. The way he sums it up, 75, came to pass that when the Lord of the vineyard saw that his fruit was good and that his vineyard was no more corrupt, you see, we've made it. He's here. It's the, the enemy of, right, of all righteousness has been cast down into the bottomless pit, right? All those beautiful promises in the book of Revelation, we made it. No more corrupt. And so what does God do? He called up his servants and said unto them, Behold, for this last time have we nourished my vineyard. Vineyard's mine, but we have worked together. Now behold us that I have done according to my will, exactly the way I had planned it all along. And I have preserved the natural fruit that it is good, even like as it was in the beginning. I love that sense of, I, the bones are good. The roots are, are real. It's all fine. We just have to remind people of who they really are. I told you I could do my own work. I've done it. 
I told you I could make you holy, and it's happened. And because of your help, notice what he says next. Blessed art thou, for because ye have been diligent in laboring with me in my vineyard, and have kept my commandments, and have brought unto me again the natural fruit, that my vineyard is no more corrupted, and the bad is cast away, behold, ye shall have joy with me because of the fruit of my vineyard. This is well done, thou good and faithful servant. This is thank you for doing things my way, for trusting the process and the pace, for believing in the good news of the gospel, that when all is said and done, it will be joy that we feel until the end is finally here, 76 and 77. Behold, for a long time will I lay up the fruit of my vineyard unto mine own self against the season, which speedily cometh. This is bringing the harvest into the garner, the temple, the great place of safety and security. And for the last time have I nourished my vineyard and pruned it and dug about it and dunged it, doing everything he's always done, Wherefore, I will lay up unto mine own self of the fruit for a long time, according to that which I have spoken. And when the time cometh, that evil fruit shall again come into my vineyard, then will I cause the good and the bad to be gathered, and the good will I preserve unto myself, and the bad will I cast away into its own place. And then cometh the season and the end, and my vineyard will I cause to be burned with fire which is such an ancient Israelite ending, <laughs> okay? Because it's so glorious. I kind of, in my modern mentality, I want to kind of cut off the last few lines and just end with all the joy and the rejoicing. But like Isaiah did in preaching so much mercy and then just ending with a final tinge of justice, lest we overswing the pendulum. Like Nephi did in his book, all of this wonderful mercy and testimony and grace and faith and glory and in Jesus. And then, uh, careful, better obey. And then he puts the pen down. Well, Zenus seems to have followed the same trajectory. Such a gloriously merciful allegory. But don't forget at the end, Christ will come. There will be a millennial reign of peace. But then Satan will be loosed for a little season. Evil will once again come into the vineyard. And when all is said and done, a final judgment will be passed as God's children go to a kingdom of glory. Let that just sink in a bit, lest we overswing the pendulum. Now, did, did you, have you endured to the end? <laughs> did you make it to the end of the play? Uh, maybe we needed to take literal intermissions every time the curtain closed for a moment. It's been a long time in coming, according to these long times had passed, and the Lord and his servants go back down to the vineyard to keep on ministering. But I hope that our verse-by-verse -verse approach has helped make sense of what otherwise might be an overly daunting chapter in the Book of Mormon. If you're the type that reads a chapter a day, then you like chapters like 1 Nephi 6, and you hate chapters like Jacob 5, because it just takes forever. Really? 77 verses? But again, I love that Jacob would pay the price to record every word. Not just give us the summary, but help us see the prophecy unroll. I hope that we've seen and wrestled with this from a literal standpoint, especially if you're a farmer. That we've seen it more importantly from an allegorical standpoint, since that's what its intent was from the start. But also, keep going back and wrestling with the moral aspects of this. And how can I eliminate sin in a sustainable way? How can I build myself upon Christ when I have rejected him at times? How can I allow the good to overcome the bad and become more equal within myself, as well as balanced with my brothers and sisters in the faith? And then anagogical, eschatological. How are we doing in the last days? If we're living in the final scene, do I trust the Lord of the harvest? He is one worth serving alongside. I, again, am so grateful he would even let us join him in the vineyard. They're his trees. 
and he loves them, everyone, from root to branch and everything in between. It is fruit that he is focused on, but he wants to preserve every one of his children. And he will if we let him and if we work alongside him.